Programming Throwdown, episode 86, Wolfram Language with Stephen Wolfram. Take it away, Jason. Hey, everyone. Happy New Year. Welcome back. And we are starting the year off with an amazing interview. Um, you know, very rarely do we get the opportunity to interview someone who actually invented a language. You know, every show, we always talk about um, a language. And here we have Stephen Wolfram on the show. And uh, Stephen, why don't you kind of describe yourself and, and Wolfram Research and kind of walk us through your journey? Oh, boy. Okay. This is a describe yourself in a few words. I, I remember <laughs> I could tell you some interesting stories about times when uh, when people have said that to me. But All right. But well, we have an hour, I, so I, you, have, the, you have plenty right. of words. Well, let's see. For the last 32 years, I've been working on what's now Wolfram Language. And uh, a couple of things that many people will know about have come out of that. One is Mathematica, which uh, was first released in 1988. So we just had our 30th anniversary. Um, and the other is Wolfram Alpha, which came out uh, in uh, 2009. Um, and uh, uh, those are, uh, Wolfram Language is, is kind of the, the core of those things. Um, I kind of started working, well, gosh, let's see. What's the story? Well, I, I got really interested in physics when I was about 10 or 11 years old, which is a depressingly long time ago now. <laughs> um, that's uh, uh, the beginning of the 1970s. And um, uh, one of the things about doing physics is you have to calculate all kinds of things with math and so on. And I was uh, very enthusiastic about physics and very unenthusiastic about calculating things with math and so on. And so I, I kind of... Uh, uh, I said, this is really boring and very mechanical and should be able to be automated. And that time was about 1972, 1973. I, I first got exposed to a computer, which was a big thing the size of a large desk and so on, programmed with paper tape and all those terrible things. Mm -hmm. But um, I started uh, uh, trying to figure out how to essentially automate the computations that I might want to do for things like physics. And that worked really well. And I discovered all kinds of interesting things in physics. And uh, uh, I got my PhD when I was 20 at Caltech. Um, and then I kind of, at that moment, actually, I was like, OK, I've been using all these computer tools. And I've kind of uh, outgrown the ones that exist today. Um, if I want to do all sorts of science and things that I'm interested in, I'm going to have to basically build my own tools. So I started building. So can you dive into that that thought process a little bit? So, so how? How did you decide that you had sort of outgrown the tool, right? I mean, you know, people okay, so, talk about so what let's happened say, is Turing the, the, complete the, and all that stuff, right? Uh, I'm sorry. The, oh, I was just going to say, you know, I, you know, you could say, oh, you know, you could do anything in assembly language. You could do anything in C. So it's actually, it requires, I think, a lot of, um, to some degree, experience or maybe wisdom is the right word, but to, to recognize that, you know, the, the productivity hit you would take from having to build something, some tool from scratch is is justified by the by the gain you would get once once you have that tool, right? Yeah, it's been interesting in my life. You know, I spent, oh, for example, a decade uh, doing big basic science projects starting in 1991. Uh, it was after the first version of Mathematica came out. And I realized that, you know, it was a decade is a long time. And, uh, you know, but then I, I realized that actually, if I had not developed Mathematica first and then done that science, I probably, it would have taken me 30 years to do what I managed to do in 10 years. So the, the five years before that, that I, that I spent developing Mathematica as a, as a tool was, uh, in the end, I was coming out way ahead relative to saying, I'll just cobble together what I need to be able to do the things that I want to do. But, but back in 1979, um, the story was, in, in a sense, simpler because I had been, um, uh, so the idea of sort of doing mathematical and algebraic computation by computer was one that had originated in the 1960s. People had built a variety of kind of research systems for doing that. Um, and I had used kind of most of the, the ones that were at all practical. Uh, for some strange reason, uh, other people never used them. It was it was like there were all these physicists and they were spending all their time with you know pencil and paper and so on calculating things. And it was like no, you know, I can just use a computer to do that. So at that and time, you're talking it. like Fortran, um, mainly Fortran, right? Well, at that time, most theoretical physicists did not use computers. 
the, okay. the m most, I mean, what happened was if you needed a computation done, you would find some programmer who would go off and do the computation. And in terms of uh, programming languages, yeah, Fortran was the main one. It's, it's still Fortran 66. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, if you were a real programmer, you used assembly language. And I remember people telling me, oh, in the, even in the 80s, people telling me, oh, you know, all these high-level languages like C, they're never going to catch on. You know, if you want to do something serious, it has to be assembly language. Yep, um, yep. That, that's kind of a story that will repeat because in terms of Wolfram language, you know, it's kind of a higher level language than one seen elsewhere. And people still say, oh, if you want to do something serious, you have to use some lower level language. It isn't true. Um, and, you know, the, the, the course of history, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very confident in the course of history in, in, in terms of that. But, yeah, I mean, but if you're willing to, to, to play the, the long game, uh, you know, Moore's law always works in your favor. And, and eventually, almost any of these optimizations that you get from C end up not being that important. So, for example, oh, but I don't think yeah. that's the point. I, I think that the real point is it's sort of uh, the conceptual level that you can reach. I mean, this is we're, we're jumping around a lot. And um, I mean, this is the super interesting stuff. But if, if you if you want to go back to the narrative of uh, of how I came to no, start no, jumping around is fine. Yeah, let's talk about yeah. about the, the trade offs between, say, Mathematica and, and writing it in C. I think that's interesting. Well, OK, so first, first thing you have to understand is in terms of Wolfram language, how do I view that? How, what do I think of it as? I, I view it as a computational language, a little different from a programming language. It's a super productive programming language, but more importantly, it's a computational language. It's a, it's a language for communicating computational ideas in an explicit, concrete form. And it's a language that allows computational ideas to be communicated and understood both by people and by machines. So kind of my, my goal in Wolfram language is to do something really very different from the goal of of other kind of, of the traditional programming languages. Um, you know, the traditional programming languages, it's kind of, okay, I've got my computer in front of me. Um, I need to tell it, you know, how to operate its transistors, so to speak, in the best possible way to get, uh, you know, to get what I want done, done. Mm -hmm. What I'm more interested in is, is how do I represent in a language the way that I think about something computationally and then it's the job of you know us as the implementers of the language to get the computer to take sort of the the goals that humans have expressed and get them implemented as efficiently as possible now in terms of and you know what what we've tried to do in Wolfram language is to build as much knowledge as possible into the language so you know typical language there's a fairly small core language and then maybe people add libraries and all kinds of other things to it and but in Wolfram language the idea is have it have as much as possible built in in a coherent way into the language. And that's a lot of work. I mean, you know, the last 32 years, basically, I've spent a large fraction of my time trying to fill in the oh, then and just build lots of stuff coherently into the language. I mean, pretty much, you know, every day I'm working on kind of the design of the language. In fact, I in the last for the last um, uh, almost a year now, I've been doing uh, actually live streaming a bunch of our internal design review meetings. I think we just passed 250 hours of live stream design review meetings. Um, so that's that like, to the public? So anyone can just to watch the public. That. Yeah, absolutely. It's on uh, uh, Twitch and Facebook Live and uh, YouTube Live. Wow, um, that's awesome. It's, it's, really, it's really pretty interesting dynamic. I mean, there's some pretty interesting, sophisticated people who tune in and they give some great comments. And I think we've... Uh, you know, we've done better design as a result of uh, things people have suggested. I mean, it's always it's always interesting because, like, well, today, let's see, I did one today. Probably the one yesterday is 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 I did a couple yesterday actually. One yesterday was interesting. Was about um, uh, well, this this relates to the whole thing about the language knows stuff. So one of the things it knows is uh, in it, it knows geographic data about the world. So it knows you know the locations of all the cities, the populations of all the cities. Uh, we happen to have curated the uh, uh, borders of all historical countries that are known. So there's a few thousand historical countries from, you know, the Roman Empire to, uh, uh, you know, the different uh, gyrations of different countries and so on. And so we got all that data. And the issue is how you deal with the language design of, of uh, talking about a historical country. So, you know, we were starting off looking at, um, well, I was... Uh, 
I was like, let's look at the Roman Empire in 55 BC. And then uh, one of the guys who's worked on this stuff said, well, actually, the Roman Empire didn't exist in 55 BC. It was the Roman <laughs> Republic in 55 BC. And it's like, OK, what does it mean for the entity? You know, what, what counts as France, for example? Right. You know, it's changed its name at various times. And so, you know, so these are questions that are an interesting mixture of sort of real world issues and uh, kind of uh, precise language design. But, but, but more than that, this was, this was actually mostly about how do you think about the sort of time series character of country borders given that one only knows them every year and how does one deal with the fact that, that um, one has a time series which kind of uh, uh, holds to one side but not to the other, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But this is, this is kind of the, 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 you know, the story of, of my life is, is trying to figure out how to take uh, these, these kinds of things and make a precise symbolic language in which one can talk about, let's say, historical countries or today's uh, live stream thing happened to be about um, uh, the display of data sets and uh, figuring out how to parametrize um, the way that a, a hierarchical data set um, is displayed and elided um, and, uh, and so on. So, so one thing that's, that, that have, has always interested me is this idea of sort of push versus pull when it comes to data. So for example, um, if we take, let's say, Google's web mirror, like Google's indexer, right? They they crawl the web, they gather a bunch of data, um, but but the, the 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 websites themselves are not particularly participating. Um, you know, they're sort of involuntarily participating. Yeah, um, I mean, what what yeah, what we've done is very different. I mean, you know, what we've been interested in for the last I don't know twenty years or so is collecting and curating as much data as possible about the world, and so. You know, what we've done mostly is, you know, we work with sort of the primary providers of data or we collect it ourselves and we try and make um, as good as possible a, a kind of a computable version of the world. I mean, this is a there's a big difference between, you know, data that's good enough for somebody to read it on a Web page and data that's good enough to compute from. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a, uh, you know, you can say, well, you know, if you you can do some, you know, NLP extraction of stuff and you can get it 80% right, and that's fine, so long as you've got a human to see that 20% of it is totally ridiculous. Right, um, right. If, you, if you're going to, in fact, one, one use case that we've been much involved with in computational contracts and smart contracts on blockchains and things like this, um, in the end, if you want those to allow one to sort of run the world by machine to machine sort of contract uh, interactions, you have to have some source of facts about the world. You know, you're selling weather insurance. You want to know, did it actually rain yesterday in wherever? Right. Um, and uh, so in fact, right now, the source in the world, for better or worse, of computational facts is the Wolfram Alpha API, because we've collected and made computable basically a, a, a huge range of kinds of facts in a way where those facts can actually be be used as, as inputs to computation in a consistent fashion. Oh, I've, I've heard about this where um, there's a there's a I think it's a betting site where you can bet on facts. You could basically you could bet yeah, whether it's, it's going to rain market, tomorrow yeah. and, and it's all done on blockchain. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, you know, that that uh, that particular activity uh, egregiously violates our terms of service. Oh, okay, all right. <laughs> nevertheless, people do it all the time. Okay, um, the, it's uh, it's uh, you know we we hope to you know one of the issues is um, you know it it uh, uh, it's like who's liable if we say so and so won the election in Bolivia or something, and you know we do our best to get it right, but it turns out you know a lot of people bet on it one way and goes the other way. It's like how does this work? Oh, that and, makes you know, sense. I think what's what's emerging is whatever Wolf Alpha says is true is true, um, which puts us in a in a curious position, um, and we're sort of working to make our sort of computational fact infrastructure, which um, deal with these kind of uh, uh, you know deciding things at that moment, so to speak, in as robust and uh, a way as possible. But you know, I think we do, you know, we've 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 gotten. To, uh, you know, much of the computational fact, c computable knowledge that we deal with 
is knowledge that wasn't stuff that happened today. I mean, we do deal with plenty that happens today, you know, earthquakes, flight sure. times, you know, all this kind of stuff. But um, I would say the majority of stuff people are using right now is uh, sort of facts that might be, you know, properties of a chemical or, you know, box office uh, results from a movie or something like this. Things which are, uh, you know, firmly in the past, so to speak, rather than um, things that, uh, you know, just happened and are complicated to verify. Um, what about, is there, so, you know, there were things like open psych, for example, where people could, could, could specify, you know, a list of, of facts about the world. Um, is, is there any way to sort of scale this outwards so that anyone can contribute and some way to deal with, you know, Byzantine contributions and things like, have you thought about things like that? Of course we have. Yeah. Of course, we've had a whole program of, of, of volunteer data curators and so on. It hasn't been particularly successful. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that there are particular well collimated types of data where people have been very good at contributing and been very helpful to us. Like, for example, properties of fictional characters in books. That was done by a big volunteer effort. Um, oh, okay. But I would yeah. say in um, uh, more precise kinds of data, um, Usually, there's some sort of professional data collection operation that's doing it, um, or nobody has done it, and, but to do it consistently is non-trivial. I mean, what we found is, you know, we employ lots of data curators, and we found that's more efficient than, uh, you know, having volunteers do it, um, because it's just, uh, uh, you know, we can train them, we, they use a bunch of nice tools, which we could make available to people, but you know it takes some training to get to be a good, efficient data curator, um, and uh, uh, you know it's it's not everybody's cup of tea. Um, that makes sense. I, I think, think there's also great ambiguity in the structure of almost any data, and so if you just give it to this heterogeneous group of volunteers, you're very rarely going to get a consistent structure. Yeah, I think one one of the challenges of data curation, and and you know. A thing I hadn't really realized, but, you know, we've built this whole sort of culture of doing data curation, and I hadn't really realized how unique that is, you know, because we do a bunch of work with, you know, all sorts of world's sort of largest companies making basically private versions of Wolfram Alpha. So the, the, the Wolfram Alpha that people know that powers Siri and uh, also has just started powering Alexa um, is uh, uh, that's that's working on public data. Um, the uh, But... We've also had a, a sort of growing business on making enterprise versions of Wolfram Alpha, where we're taking the internal data of some large company and letting people ask unstructured questions about that internal data, making use of public data plus their internal data. So, you know, somebody might say, what were my sales between Christmas and New Year in sub-Saharan Africa or something? And, you know, for that, you have to know things about the world like Christmas and New Year. You have to know, you know, what sub-Saharan Africa, you have to be able to know currency conversion rates, all those kinds of things. And to answer that question, you have to go be hooked up to the, you know, internal databases of company X um, to go and to go and answer that. So, so we've been, um, uh, that's, um, uh, you know, we, 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 we've done a bunch of those things. And, and one of the things that's been interesting is, is that people are sort of horrified, you know, you mean you actually have to go and do things with humans to make all this stuff work? <laughs> well, yes. I mean, you know, it's, it's, we can do, we have very good, you know, we've got very leading edge machine learning stuff and NLP stuff and so on. Um, but, you know, that's not, if you really want to make computable data, you can't use that stuff. You can use it to help prime various pumps, but in the end, humans and experts end up having to be in the loop if you actually want to build something that is capable of being a foundation on which you can build sort of a, a big computational tower. And I think you know, one of the things about the, the culture of data curation um, is uh, it's, it's interesting because uh, you know, there's a large volume of work to be done and there's also judgment to be exercised. And it's a, it's a tricky management issue how you propagate sort of judgment calls up and down kind of the the chain of of uh, of of people who are who are working on this type of thing you know at what point do you propagate you know uh, i don't know in in um you know is this a uh, i don't know like if you're doing image curation you know does this really count as an elephant 
or is it a model, a plastic elephant? You know, what does mm -hmm. a, do we really call this an elephant or do we call it a toy? Yep. And somebody, you know, uh, at some point, somebody has to make a decision like that, but you have to kind of propagate that to the point where that decision is made by somebody with appropriate experience and who knows how it fits together with the rest of the system, but the person who's actually looking at pages and pages of images um, doesn't, you know, isn't isn't the one who has to has to be figuring that out all the all the time. I, I feel like there's something like kind of philosophically profound about that. You know, there's there's basically two types of jobs. There's there are jobs that have almost infinite scalability, and then there are jobs that that don't. So, for example. Um, being a musician now has is one of these jobs that scales in the sense that some famous musician will will go in a studio and record a song once and then it gets played on the radio over the whole world to millions of people. Uh, you know, being a software engineer is also one of these scalable jobs where you can design some software that's used by billions of people with with only you know say a, a few hundred engineers, right? Yeah, and yeah. and. Uh, uh, you know, everyone is really worried about, say, automation taking a job that isn't scalable, like truck driving, and turning it into a scalable job. But, but in your case, you're kind of doing the opposite, where you are taking a, a job that had been done with, say, NLP, you know, poorly, and you're you're uh, changing the the scale, changing that that sort of dynamic to get something that has really high fidelity. And it's funny how even intuitively, like on the surface, I kind of you know my first reaction is oh that doesn't that doesn't scale but maybe that that's actually a good thing right is is maybe what we need is to have more of a human touch oh i don't know i think the, the fact is the thing to understand is uh, uh what does it mean it doesn't scale the world is finite you know when we started working on wolfram alpha I, I had been interested in building something like wolfram alpha since i was a kid i've been interested in kind of uh being able to sort of uh, collect information, um, answer questions from it, and so on. I mean, uh, horrifyingly, I, I found a bunch of stuff I did when I was like 12 years old, which is sort of pre-Wolfram Alpha stuff with, you know, typewriter rather than, uh, you know, data centers, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, it's, always, it's always upsetting in a sense. I don't know if it's upsetting or satisfying to discover one's really been doing the same thing all one's life. But anyway, <laughs> I was, I was interesting, interested to, you know, I'd been interested in kind of can you make computational knowledge real since since I was a kid. And, you know, I had I had actually always assumed that one had to kind of invent the whole of AI to do that. And eventually, as a result of a bunch of science I did, I kind of realized that wasn't the case. But when we started doing the Wolfram Alpha project, it was like, OK, let's take the team over to a big reference library. And let's look at this reference library. And it's like it's a big thing with, you know, full of books. And my basic statement was, OK, over the next few years, we're going to grind all of the knowledge that's in here and we're going to make it computable. And, you know, it's a daunting task, but it is finite. You know, it's a finite sized room, so to speak. And we got much more knowledge than was in, you know, the big reference library. But it's mm -hmm. worth realizing that, that um, you know, there's a our civilization has only collected sort of a, a finite amount of knowledge about things. It, it's always surprising you know, uh, the, the amount of sort of uh, purely uh, structured data that there is in the world is quite big compared to, for example, the text content of the web. I mean, I don't know whose estimate you want to take, but let's say the web is, I don't know, some modest number of tens of billions of pages of text. Um, you know, there's actually much more of that in structured data that even we have um, sure. for, for Malfa, but but um, so, in other words, even if you say, well, gosh, let's, you know, use the scaling of the web and try and deduce knowledge from it, there actually isn't that much there. Um, that makes and, sense, uh, yeah. They, you know, and it's, um, but I think, you know, for me, there are two big multipliers that go beyond the sort of curate the data type thing. Uh, one is uh, knowledge about computation, knowledge about algorithms, how you compute things from that data. Because actually, most of the time, people don't just want that one number that was sitting in a database. They want something that was the particular thing they wanted to know that is computed using some method or model or algorithm or something from the raw data that might sit in the database or whatever. Right. Or they're even but looking for some signal. They want to decrease the entropy. So for example, um, they have a bunch of sales data and they want to know which countries are outliers. So they want some 
tree of some decision tree that's going to say, you know, this area of the world is performing great. This area of the world is performing poorly. And they want sure. your system to extract that high level information. Right. But you see now, take that example. It's an interesting example because it's an example where the kind of, you know, knowledge based approach that we use in Wolfram language is, is important because let's say you've got that raw sales data. You've got the table of numbers. You've got the number for, you know, Luxembourg. You've got the number for Germany. You've got et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. On, on its own, those numbers aren't all that significant because if you don't know, let's say, the population or the GDP or the number of, you know, internet users or something in each of those countries, it's hard to make all that much from it. Um, and so it becomes really important to have, you know, good computable data that you can use as part of the kind of pipeline of actually doing things. And you could say, well, I'll go scrape that data from somewhere. Okay, great. You know, the, then, you know, you, you scrape the data, you discover that countries that have, you know, spaces in their names don't work, right, et cetera, right. et cetera, et cetera. I mean, it, it's some, um, uh, and this is, you know, the, this is what I've been trying to do is to kind of add this kind of layer of kind of automated computational intelligence that people can kind of take for granted in computing things. I mean, I, you know, the way I see it, if I look at kind of the, the longer arc of history, uh, you know, back from like 60 years ago and so on, when the first uh, computers were coming out, it was like, well, you could take for granted the fact that there'd be some, what was called a high level language like COBOL or Fortran on that computer. Then a few years later, you could take for granted there'd be an operating system on the computer. Then a few years later, take for granted there'd be some kind of user interface or some kind of networking support on the computer. And what I'm trying to do basically is to let people take for granted a sort of layer of computational intelligence that they can expect to find on a computer. And where we've tried to take sort of the, the knowledge that our civilization has accumulated and try to sort of inject that as something that can be automatically accessed by anybody. And that's kind of, you know, that's kind of the bigger picture of what we're trying to do. And sort of the, 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 uh, a couple of branches of doing that. I mean, in Wolfram Alpha, we're trying to m make a sort of consumerized drive-by version of that where you just ask a question with natural language. You can, you know, ask it by voice since, you know, through intelligent assistance, or you can type it on the website or whatever. Um, and the, you know, natural language, like the, let me ask a question, like, you know, what was the uh, uh, population of, um, uh, of France in 1952 or something? Um, that's something one can easily ask as a kind of natural language question. And that's what we're doing with Wolfram Alpha. With Wolfram Language, we have a precise language in which a question like that can be expressed. It's very simple to express, but in which one can build up much more sophisticated kinds of things um, in which one can sort of represent. It, it provides a, a more precise way than human language to represent what one's talking about when one thinks about things computationally. I mean, a, a way to think about this that sort of emerged recently is um, when we think about contracts, people want to say, I want to say precisely what's going to happen. Well, they try and write it in English. Actually, they wind up with some kind of legalese that's some kind of very stilted English often. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, what we're trying to do is to make it possible to say what you want to have happen in code, in precise computational language code, but that code, in order to talk about what you want to have happen, it has to be able to talk about things in the world. I mean, it's no good to just say, okay, I'm going to declare, you know, uh, declare that there's a, an array of integers of length, whatever. That's not really good enough. You have to be able to say, uh, you know, if the person is more than 50 miles from this place, then whatever. And that requires that you understand geopositions and distances and, you know, all this kind of thing. You have to actually understand stuff about the world to be able to express these things. But what, what I've been trying to do is to make a language in which you can express those kinds of things, um, but you can do it precisely and you can do it in a way that you, where you can kind of build up, uh, you know, many, many layers of, of complexity. So, you know, in a, in a typical, when you interact with Wolfram Alpha, it's like, you know, the typical thing will be, you know, a, a fragment of a sentence or maybe a whole sentence. When you look at what people do with Wolfram language, you know, there are well, probably the biggest code base we have. Um, I don't know what our total. I know Wolfram Alpha is about 15 million lines of Wolfram language code. 
um, I think our, our whole Wolfram language code base, which is mostly written in Wolfram language now, is around 50 million lines. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a uh, it's rather dense code because it's you know it's very you know very high level symbolic uh, representation of things. But so so kind of the idea is that that one be able to you know my my goal is to give people sort of a, a um, to be able to let them sort of in every line of that code make use of all the knowledge that that our civilization's been able to accumulate um and uh you know don't have to build everything kind of from the sand up so to speak yeah that makes sense i think it's it's fascinating one of the the things that i've felt in the past is uh the way um and then i'll jump to something else but but the way google has sort of crawled the web it's really kind of i mean you know it's it's a great service but one of the issues with that is the, the data, as you said, hasn't been very structured and other people haven't been able to play a role. Um, you know, Even though you might not have volunteers, but you're still going out to these data providers who are ultimately going out to the actual source of that information. Mm -hmm. And there's this sort of two-way conversation. Uh, and I think that that adds a lot to the richness of the data, um, which I think I think is awesome. What do you deal, uh, how do you deal with, um, let's say questions around saliency? So if, if someone wants to say, um, you know, tell me something interesting about my profits in the past ten years, or something like that. Like, how do you avoid? Uh, you know, how do you how, how do you take into account someone's mental model? So, so when they ask something, it's not just sort of a laundry list of details. Well, that's but interesting. You kind of take you know, into account their intuition there, right? Right. I mean, it's interesting when when I started working on Wolf Mouth. Uh, you know, I kind of designed this framework for figuring out, okay, so what does the sort of automated report that Wolf Malford generates look like? And I thought we're going to have to iterate this a zillion times to make it, you know, useful to people. Uh, turns out, you know, with a with a bunch of like, fairly clever heuristics and things, we do remarkably well. And, you know, because we obviously have data on what people click on and, you know, where they read and so on. And, you know, I think it's a but it requires, you know, expert knowledge to build these things. So, I mean, those heuristics are built by using the fact that, you know, somebody who actually knew a lot about this field helped define those heuristics. If it was just like, let's automate it, let's try and put a ranking algorithm in here and just do it based on, you know, we don't know what this is. It's just a question of how the words are correlated. And, you know, let's use, um, you know, TFIDF or something to do something. Mm -hmm. That's a it's a you know that it, it's turned out that that was actually of all the various things you know it was one of many things that I thought was going to be really difficult with Wolfram Alpha that turned out uh, you know we had a bunch of big advantages in terms of the 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 way our algorithmic system was the framework was built and also the kind of way that we made use of you know experts all the way through what we've done. Um, but uh, you know that turned out to be making reports that are what people care about has turned out to be remarkably you know that that has not turned out to be the difficult thing now if you say okay let me you know throw me some random data tell me something interesting about it we actually have done that a bit we actually had a, a the pro version of Wolfram Alpha you can actually upload data sets and it will try and do things like that I don't consider that particularly successful I mean I, I don't think people you know people find it amusing but I don't think it's, uh, I, I don't consider it kind of um, uh, something that is a, a uh, uh, you know, a core thing that people really care about at this point. That makes sense. Um, I mean, I, I think it's it's profoundly difficult to to come up with some kind of distance metric there. Like if, if, if you, if you, if someone gives you a bunch of financial data and you just project that into some latent space, you'll end up with some distance metric, but it probably doesn't match their mental model. And, and things that you right. think are really close or really important actually aren't. Okay, so so this, I mean, it happens to be something I've thought about a lot is the theory of interestingness. So in other words, if you've, so I've studied a lot kind of uh, simple programs out in the computational universe, things like cellular automata and so on. And so you look at lots of these cellular automata and you say, which ones of these are interesting? Right. You know, you look at them and some of them look, oh, they, that's that's kind of cool. You know, it does all these things. But which ones are interesting? Or, or you can do the same thing for chemicals, let's say. You can start enumerating possible, you know, hydrocarbon structures. And you can say, which ones of these are interesting? So interestingness is a is a very cultural kind of thing. That yep. is what is interesting to somebody 
depends on you know the whole history of how they got there and and for us as a civilization you know when we say well what's interesting to invent you know or what mathematical theorems are worth proving those are things which are you know a very history and context dependent and in fact it's it's really so okay in in my world as a as a language designer um is is a, a way to think about this so you know you can imagine sort of concepts in the world and you could say, well, which ones of these concepts are interesting? You know, you, we see stuff, let's say, you know, in the Stone Age or something. We saw, you know, uh, I don't know, um, you know, different cracks in mud or something or different kinds of puddles or something like this. And at some point we decided, well, puddles were interesting enough that we would give them a name. And so as, as human language emerged, you know, somebody said, OK, that's called a pub puddle. And then, you know, people could discuss puddles and they could discuss lakes and they could discuss other things for which they had names. Right. So in other words, the, there was sort of a, 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 a con, um, uh, uh, this sort of condensed, this, this cluster of things in the world condensed into a concept that was interesting enough to be given a name. That's right. And it is and so, actually culture, as you said, it's culture dependent. You know, the, the common, um, uh, the, the one that everyone talks about is how Eskimos have, I think, 50 words for snow. And that's just because that that snow occupies a big spot in their mental model of the world right. because they see so much of it, right? Right, exactly. Uh, but I think in, in um, and so, okay, so what does a language designer do? Well, a language designer has to think about, you know, what are all the computations people might want to do, of which there are sort of an infinite collection. And if you, uh, as, as I've done, you know, study the sort of abstract space of possible computations and so on, you realize there are even more of these possible computations to do. The question is, which of these are interesting enough to give them names, to make them primitives in your computational language, and to have people think in terms of them? And that's, you know, that I think is the sort of at a meta level, that is the role of the language designer, is to figure out, you know, what are the repeated lumps of computational work that you should define as primitives and build your language out of? And what's what's really interesting to me is that what... When you build your language and you identify certain primitives and you give people this language, they will start thinking in terms of that language. And so, you know, one of the achievements, I think, with Wolfram Language is that we've, you know, lots of things have been invented and discovered with the language and with Mathematica and so on over the years. And I, you know, I can't quantify it, but I think some significant fraction got discovered because we gave people a framework for thinking about things that was of a computational nature and that sort of condensed their kind of concepts into these things, into these kind of conceptual anchors that are the primitives of the language. Um, and I think that that's, uh, and so the way that works, it's kind of an interesting spiral because um, as you build certain primitives, you get to think about things in different ways. And when you've thought about those things in different ways, then you can build another level of primitives. And we're kind of continually in the history of sort of civilization, we're continually building these layers of abstraction as a result of having successfully sort of condensed our concepts into definite things that we give, for example, names to. That makes sense. And, I mean, that's why, you know, if you go back, I'm probably not going to get this chronologically right, but if you go back enough, far enough, you, you get to the point where only the, the most brilliant mathematicians could understand geometry. And now you can't get a high school certificate without knowing geometry. And that's only because, as you said, we've compacted that and we've made that so innate and so unconscious that, that it can be broadcast to everybody. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I think one of the things that one can think about about education and, and the history of sort of development of, of, of civilization again um, is, you know, as time has gone on, we know more and more stuff. And you might think, oh, my gosh, that means we have to, you know, people have got to be educated for 100 years in order to be sort of functional in the world because there's all this stuff to know. But the thing that that's ignoring is the fact that there have been these moments of kind of uh, where these kind of moments of unification and abstraction that happen that allow one to take something like what you're just describing. You don't have to learn every, you know, you don't have to rote learn every theorem in Euclid you can know certain principles of geometry, and that allows you to figure out a lot of things without having to to go through every every detail to get there. And that's but you know the thing that's important about that from the point of view of language design, computational language design, it's kind of the same story. It's like what do you have to put into the language 
that gives people that 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 gives people a framework for their thinking that lets them sort of make use of this process of abstraction. And as far as I'm concerned, you know, people don't yet understand, uh, you know, the role of computational language in 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 you know framing the way that people think about things. Um, it's a you know it's a funny thing because people talk about you know the Sapper Whorf hypothesis for for human natural languages, um, and that's you know the hypothesis that the uh, the words in your language define how you think about things. And people mm-hmm. argue oh, how uh, how valid is Sapper Whorf, and you know is it uh, is it really a significant thing or not? And and you know that's there are uh, sort of uh, you know it's it's a it's I think it's it's a real thing in human language, but it's somewhat weak in human language. In computational language, it's extremely strong. That is, the things you think about, you know, we've developed in, you know, Wolf language, we've developed sort of a way of thinking about things. And you can kind of see that people, you know, I, I know for myself and I can see with, with other people who are kind of fluent uh, Wolf language uh, uh, users, the, I would say speakers. I, 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 it's a funny thing. I, I, <laughs> years ago, yeah. it was, uh, it happened to, uh, visit this group of, I think they were 11 year olds at the time, who were who had been learning Wolf language and uh, very smart kids, and that was the only time I've ever heard that people actually speak our computational language, and it was a very bizarre experience for me because you know I invented this language, but yet I couldn't process it fast enough. You know, the the uh, I'm just not used to hearing it as a spoken language. Um, it's nice. very, very bizarre to, to um, but, but anyway, I mean, people, it's, uh, you know, it, it's interesting to me that, for example, when I'm trying to think about something and, you know, I can start typing Wolfram language code much faster than I could explain to you what I'm about to do. So that's, you know, that's what it's like to be sort of fluent in that kind of computational thinking. And with that, with our, you know, computational language as a way of expressing that computational thinking is, you know, the, 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 the thoughts are forming, so to speak, around what will emerge as that language, rather than the thoughts are forming in a way that I could express in human natural language and then sort of translate into computational language. That makes sense. What about, I mean, you know, things tend to be moving towards, let's say, more of like these, what's the right word, like signal processing or statistical based approaches where you, you don't actually know anything atomic you just throw a bunch of data into some, some uh, you know, layered, some system, some neural network or something that's just, you know, this composition of embeddings. And then you cross your fingers kind of on the other side, right? Um, yeah. And, and so how does, you know, with, with that sort of trending and, and people wanting to sort of automatically extract signal, where does Wolfram language kind of fit into that my guess is it sort of would provide a very nice sort of basis function or basis set of data that then someone can go and 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 do that that kind of thing or maybe maybe it's that no that those I, people I, are totally wrong and really the, the yeah, basis, no, that, that's, you know, is i don't the think answer. that's quite the right way to think about it i mean it, it's the same as the way that we use so so for a long time these kind of soft tasks like identify whether this is a picture of an elephant or a teacup those were very hard for computers. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, nowadays with modern machine learning, that's rather easy. Um, and so there are these these tasks that had traditionally, these kind of soft tasks that had traditionally been very hard. And what's happened, you know, if you look at how that's interacting with, with Wolfram language, I mean, we happen to have a rather wonderful sort of highest level machine learning framework that people have right now happens to be the thing we built on top of uh, on top of MXNet, you know, which is a you know low level framework for mm-hmm. for machine learning. Um, the uh, but but you know the way that interacts with Wolfram language is there's a function called image identify, and the innards of that function make use of all of this kind of soft neural net stuff. But at the end of the day, it's like okay, we'll take you know a thousand images and we run image identify on all of them, and then we start making histograms of how many rhinoceroses and how many you know eagles were there in those pictures and so on. So in other words, these these kind of uh, sort of soft things become elements of what is then ultimately going to be this big structure that we build. I mean, if we think about it in terms of the way that that humans work on stuff, again, 
uh, let's imagine it's a it's a legal contract. Somewhere in the legal contract, it will say, if it's a ripe, you know, if if the bananas are, are too ripe, then they'll be rejected. Okay, and mm -hmm. that you know, if the bananas are too ripe, that's a soft question. Right. But the whole chain of things around then they'll be rejected, and then this payment will happen, and then that will happen, and so on. That's all sort of symbolic structure. I mean, we look at it in terms of how we as humans act. You know, symbolic structure is what we tend to represent, like in a conversation like this, with with our human language. But there are other things that we do that are, you know, the way that we automatically process things in our visual system, where we say, "Yeah, I'm looking at a, you know, at a a, a bottle of water or something." That's something that is happening at at that level. Now, there is an interesting trade-off that's happening right now. Uh, of so so there's certain kinds of tasks where it's absolutely true the best you know the, a really good way to do it is you just give it a bunch of training examples you let it learn uh, it's been interesting you know what does it mean to do data curation in a world of machine learning so for example we have this neural network repository and the importance of that is that we are not there the main thing we're learning is things like feature extractors right so you know, and that, you know, that is a very useful piece of curation. You know, it is a piece of sort of uh, the fact that we now have a really good feature extractor for images or, uh, you know, or really good we're getting a pretty good feature extractor for sounds, for example, as well. Um, the, uh, you know, that then allows us to compute a lot of things. And that's kind of a, 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 a you know, a different kind of data curation. I mean, just like, um, you know, we, when we were first doing, uh, sort of modern machine learning stuff, maybe five, six years ago, um, you know, one of the big advantages that we had was that we were very experienced at doing data curation. So when it was a question of, okay, take all these images and figure out what they're, what they're of, it wasn't just, oh, we'll just search the web and see what tags they have. We actually had good processes for being able to inject, you know, some human knowledge into, into being able to do that. But I think there's a there's another thing which is sort of the trade-off between what is uh, um, you know what's some uh, um, uh, what's some uh, when when do you have a model of things? I mean, so for example, is machine learning the end of science? Is an interesting question. Yes. <laughs> um, in other words, you know, one has been interested in physics, for example, in saying let's understand, let's let's write down some theoretical model for this process and let's work through that theoretical model and see what consequences it has that's sort of you know uh way number one for doing it way number two for doing it is say let's just take a bunch of examples and try and machine learn the results so so for example let's say you're trying to work out you know that sound your washing machine is making is that is the washing machine about to blow up or is it perfectly happy well one approach you can take is to use like we have this whole system modeling systems engineering system, um, you can actually have some some uh, sort of engineering model of your washing machine and you can try and compute from it the resonant frequencies and work out vibrations and so on and figure out what's going to happen to your washing machine. Or you can just say, let's just measure 10,000 washing machines and throw it all into a neural network and see what comes out. Um, it's interesting. I'm not sure, you know, what we're seeing, uh, you know, in people who use our technology stack they can do both of these things with it. And it's interesting to see, uh, you know, in, in the last few years, there are some things where, well, the black box method is working really well. Other things where the black box method just doesn't seem to be making it. Yeah. And you actually need to kind of understand what's going on. Yeah, exactly. I think I think that's that's exactly it is you. I, I look at it as sort of three layers. The bottom layer is 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 are, are what questions. So, um, you know, what you know, here, here's a washing machine. Uh, what will happen today? Will it break or not? And so you can take thousands of washing machines. You can you can say these ones broke today. These ones didn't. Um, I mean, you have a bit of a sampling problem. Let's say you take millions of washing machines, and and you can figure that out. And and you know, automated methods are getting very good at that, right? But then if you move up, the next level are kind of how questions or control control theory questions. And so I feel as if when you do the pure automated way at the bottom and then you try to do control on top of that, it becomes very difficult because you don't you don't actually know what you're controlling. 
because those yeah. those signals are not the the signals are just effectively coming from noise. You you don't know the difference between that data and noise. And okay, you've extracted signal from it, but now you're trying to control based on that. And then the the, the top layer is causal analysis. So so why am I even doing taking this policy? Why am I even doing this this controller based on these right. signals? And 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 you kind of you end up sort of kneecapping or handicapping yourself when you do too much automation, too much unstructured learning at one of those lower layers. You make it impossible to, to build the layer above it. Well, I mean, one way to think about this is if you ask, is there a role for kind of computational language, for symbolic language, or should we just throw everything into, you know, a, a black box machine learning system? Well, you know, if you look at the difference between humans and other animals, you kind of see what the what the payoff is for symbolic language. That's the way in which we differ. You know, yes, you can get your your average beaver or something to do many of the tasks that you know we can expect to do without this you know construction of symbolic language that allows us to express abstract things and so on. Um, there's a there's a level that you can do and and you know which we were unable to do with computers properly until quite recently, but now those become components in what you know in our sort of human development has been all the stuff we've built. You know our civilization was made possible by this idea of symbolic language and by the idea of being able to express abstraction and so on. And that's, you know, that's in a sense what, what, you know, what someone like me is trying to capture in the computational language that we're building. I mean, what's interesting about the computational language is it's kind of another level of, of sort of communication. I mean, in other words, when, you know, back in the day, well, you know, th there was, you know, the, the most basic level of communication for, for life is genetic. You know, you pass to your offspring certain certain information then there's then there's things where sort of things are automatically learnt in each generation like your visual system you know learns from the actual objects and correlations it sees in the world your visual system you know just like a neural net um learns how to see so to speak yeah uh, but then you know the big innovation of our species is that we get to actually communicate stuff from one generation to the next using sort of abstract symbolic representation of ideas. But still, we're kind of stuck because, you know, one generation can write the books, the next generation can be like, oh, we don't understand the books. Or, it, it, you know, when you talk to somebody, it's like you form the thoughts in your brain, you express those thoughts in, in human language. But then the person on the other end has to do a whole bunch of work in their brain to absorb that language to fit it into their thought patterns to be able to take action on the basis of it. The thing that's pretty interesting in terms of computational language is we don't need that, that second step. Once we've expressed something in computational language, it is immediately executable. And, that's, uh, and so in other words, when we're, you know, the way I see that in terms of, of sort of the AI world is we get to, instead of just having to, you know, we could, we could like talk to our AIs in human natural language, and we can try and say, yeah, you know, we want you to do this and that and the other, and the AI can try and figure out what one's talking about. All one can, if one has a good way of expressing sort of one's human goals in a, computa in a precise computational language, and you just say, okay, here's what I want to have happen. Now it's up to the AI to figure out how to make that happen in the most efficient possible way, but you've expressed what your goals are in a, in a precise fashion. I mean, I think that the, you know, again, in a sense, the, the you know, the role of automation is, uh, you know, humans define, you know, what you want to have happen is humans define what they want, then it gets actuated as automatically as possible. But a piece to that is humans have to define what they want. And now that, you know, with computation and AI and so on, the set of things that we can get done automatically is very broad. There's a big focus on, so how do you tell, in a sense, how do you tell the AIs what you want them to do? And that's, again, that's, you know, that's why I care about computational language is that gives us this bridge between our human goals and human thinking and what we can get 
computers, computation, and so on to do. And that's you know that that's that's why um, you know I, I see it as being a um, uh, a pretty important thing in kind of the the history of of uh, uh, of, of kind of you know developing kind of well. Uh, sort of uh, the, the the trajectory of, of human civilization. It's it's a it's an important moment that we're at right now, where we can automate a very wide range of things. The question is just to say, uh, you know, what do we actually want, and then to be able to describe what we want. And that's you know that's the uh, we we have a program for uh, middle school kids, um, and uh, I think the tagline. Last I knew, at least the tagline was, "Who's going to tell the AIs what to do?" <laughs> um, nice. And um, it's, uh, um, I think the, um, I mean, it, it's an interesting thing in terms of of education and what people should be learning about. I mean, th this idea of of sort of thinking about things computationally is, you know, this is the really important thing of this of this time in history. I mean, we are we are. The sort of the 21st century is the time when the computational paradigm basically took over everything. Um, yeah, in, I think in the one of the things there is is I'm seeing a lot of research lately around um, uh, these generative adversarial networks, right? And so the idea mm -hmm. there is you want to project things into some latent space. That was sort of the big thing of let's say the last decade or the last five years was this the this sort of compositional embedding and how powerful that is. And you've and a lot of the unsupervised methods got kind of wiped out by deep learning, right? Um, now you're seeing sort of these approaches to try to reverse the process. So you'll see, for example, um, someone will use a GAN to generate endless amounts of birds. You know that was one of that was a research paper I saw. Or, or for example, they would use a GAN to reverse an embedding and generate a text description from a picture. So right. you know, there's a picture of a person sitting on a bench um, that's in the test set, and the, the training set didn't have that, but it had a lot of benches and a lot of people, and the system was smart enough to, to sort of right. reverse right. that embedding and create language. But it's an extraordinarily difficult problem, and, and, and you know, as opposed to images where people have understood that convolutional nets and these things have really captured the regularity of images we haven't really done that for language and you know definitely the research should continue but but i think an alternative might be um you know at the educational level getting people to communicate with computers in a slightly different way that that might be the low-hanging fruit there rather than yeah, trying yeah. to you know reverse engineer the the entire history of of, of human language no, no, I think you're right. I mean, I think that the the human language is is decently optimized for humans communicating with each other. You know, computers. You know, we, we are in the business. You know, we built this whole NLU system that you know is used in Wolfram Alpha. That's in the business of taking the random things that people say to their phones or their you know cylinders in their kitchens or whatever, <laughs> um, and uh, you know, and trying to make sense of those and. And you know, for small utterances, we can do quite well. For building up a whole complicated story, you could do it, but it's really a pretty silly way to do it. Now, right, and the state becomes a big problem. So if someone says, you know, I mean, you, you hear these these these, um, you know, people will showcase these examples, but they're always very contrived. So someone will say, uh, you know, Google was showing this off at one point. Someone would say, uh, you know, what time? Or, or you know, what's the movie with this actor? And they would say, I don't know, Black Panther. And the person yeah. would say, what time is that? And that subsequent query would have the context of the first query. Yeah, right. would know. But, but that is, it's so hand-coded. You're getting a system to keep state of what of the conversation uh, in, a, in an automated way. No one's even come close to that. And, 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 and we expected so much more progress than we've got as a community that that, so, that might not be a good problem to be solving right i mean so so here's an analogy so back 500 years ago literacy was not common right but written you know people didn't know how to read and write so certain kinds of things could be expressed by you know spoken things people had to memorize they're probably better at memorizing things back then but you know there was a time when for example if you 
you know, longer ago in history, like with lawyers, you know, they would read the law. Somebody would recite, well, not read it. They would recite the law. They knew every law and they would just recite the law to decide what, you know, whether somebody was doing the right thing or not. Then when literacy came in, it, it enabled a much greater level of sophistication and richness. You know, you, you, could, you could create things that were much more, you know, you could write books and many people could read them and so on. I think that uh, what your, uh, you know, this, this whole question about whether, whether it's um, uh, human natural language is, is good for expressing certain kinds of things, but when it comes to building big structures, it's not very good. You know, if you imagine writing some big, doing some big piece of software engineering where every piece of it was written with human natural language, it really wouldn't work very well. Now, a couple of things to say about that. So one thing I found really interesting. So, you know, I worked on Wolfram Language for, uh, oh, what was it, 15 years or so before I started working on Wolfram Alpha. Wolfram Language is a very precise language. Everything is precisely defined and very, you know, there's a precise meaning to everything. Then I started out working on Wolfram Alpha, where the idea is people should just talk to it and say whatever they want to say. And there's no documentation. It's just like, it's our job just to understand those weird things that humans say to it. Okay, so I decided to adopt a completely different design philosophy. So in, in Wolfram Language, you know, one of the things is I want everything to be as consistent as possible. I want to minimize concepts. I want to have uh, everything be sort of infinitely factorable and so on and so on and so on. For Wolfram Alpha, it's just a pure do what I mean type type story. And it's just like deal with whatever crazy things the humans say. Right. right. So those were two, it was interesting for me because those were two very different design methodologies. Um, and I was, you know, it took me a little while to get used to the second one. But then, you know, I, I used to be very afraid of heuristics. I used to say, never use heuristics. It's crazy. And then, you know, in Wolfram Alpha, it's all heuristics. It's like, what, is, what, do you, what does a human mean when they say, you know, 50 cents? Oh, they mean something about money. If they say 50 cent, they probably mean a wrapper. Oh yeah, you know, right. it's very you know it's it's but if they say forty seven cent, you know that's probably a mistake for forty for forty seven <laughs> right. cents. You know, so it's it's just all heuristics. Right? Doesn't and that so I mean, I learned, when you told when you said that example, it made me feel sort of agoraphobic, right? I mean, it just sounds like there's an endless amount of there. There's no end to the amount of things the heuristics that you need to add to the system, right? Well, yes, that's what I thought, right? I thought, oh my gosh, the thing's going to drown in heuristics, right? And but what I learned after a while is there's a there's a logic to heuristics, and and yes there are lots and lots of them. I mean it's a for example if you're into software quality assurance, uh, you know doing SQA on um, uh, natural language understanding system is one of the scariest things you can you can do in that in that business because nothing is modular. Mm -hmm. You know the whole system. You know you can end up if there's a new wrapper who comes on the scene called forty seven cent. That just blew up a bunch of your <laughs> NLU for for financial transactions and so on. Um, so it's it's a very very weird thing. But um, uh, the the, um, uh, the 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 point, you know, when when in working on Wolfram Alpha, it was just this heuristics, you know, the logic of heuristics. Working on Wolfram Language, it's the sort of very precise, very uh, sort of formal way of doing things. And I didn't know, you know, I thought these were two different branches. Very interesting thing happened a few years ago when we started to basically build Wolfram Alpha capabilities into Wolfram language. What I realized is that there are little fragments of when you write code and you need a list of the US states, for example, you just say control equals list of US states. That's a natural language. You hit return. It turns that into a precise symbolic representation of that that then becomes something precise that you can use in your program. And so what ends up happening is there are these little fragments of natural language that you use for things like that. You don't say, you know, uh, map this pure function over this using natural language. That's a total lose. But you do say, give me the list of state capitals in the U.S. or something. That you can say with natural language. So there's this interesting sort of, uh, uh, you know, connection between these two things. I mean, it's worth realizing that that you know, the software engineering stack that you need to make all this stuff work is somewhat complicated because when you're dealing with, you know, for example, the thing I just said, let's imagine you're, you know, you're mapping over some list of state capitals. Okay. That list of, and you're doing it in some, you know, version of Wolfram language that's sitting on a desktop computer. 
that list of state capitals lives inside our knowledge base in the cloud. It has to, you know, it's a it's a sort of language where where things, you know, uh, sort of it, it's a it's a language where it can make use of this kind of vast pool of knowledge that exists in the cloud. It's downloaded, you know, sort of magically downloaded and cached, and you know, all those wonderful things. Um, but it's it's sort of interesting that again that's a that's a different kind of uh, software engineering experience, so to speak, uh, to what one might be used to with oh, this is just a language and it, it compiles into machine code type thing. Um, yeah, but- it seems like it seems like that there that that whole concept of you know I wonder if 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 you need to if it needs if if the programming language needs to be attached to this sort of common sense reasoning database or maybe you know maybe they do have to be attached but but my guess is there's probably a large use case where somebody has you know because the vast majority of what let's say someone's building an app the vast majority of their app um is going to be written in a specific language and that language is going to be designed around showing buttons and showing you know uh sliders and things like that um but then they could take advantage of the cap the, the, this this sort of knowledge database and this knowledge language it, it could almost like be embedded into sure. any process yeah. that someone's doing right? you know that's the least less interesting way to do it okay all I right mean, yes we we have a a great way of making instant apis where people can call us just for little bits where they where they have figured out that we can do them what's much more interesting is to think about everything you're doing in this kind of very high level symbolic way and because you get to do a lot more, like let's say you're laying out those buttons. Okay, well we have a, a symbolic representation for you know a user interface that's completely program, you know that ever for the last twenty years or something has been a completely program manipulable thing. So it's something where yeah you could write you know hard code to lay out these buttons in this way, but you can you can have a symbolic structure that is you know computed with nice functional programming sort of on the fly that does that button layout and being able to think about that or you could say uh you know uh, make the buttons be i don't know let's say a crazy thing you know let, let's say you want to you're putting buttons to represent uh which city you want to go to next well you can actually use geographic data to place the buttons in your interface it's kind of a stupid idea but but you know no, but, I mean, but, but I mean, the whole it could be interesting i mean maybe you have a spinning globe or something like that yeah, right. But I mean, the, the, the point is being able to, the, 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 the big thing with Wolfram language is it's free to do fancy stuff. You know, with most, if somebody says, oh, by the way, I've got, you know, oh, I'm going to have 10 cities and let me do a traveling salesman tour, uh, you know, through those cities. And somebody says, oh my gosh, I got to figure out how to write this traveling salesman. Download thing. a library. Sometimes yeah, right. library doesn't work. Right. But the whole point is for us, it's free to do that stuff. It's just sitting there. It's just some function that does it. And by the way, you asked much earlier about sort of the trade-off between writing things in low-level languages and writing things in, you know, a knowledge-based language, you know, that uh, like Wolfram language. Here's what I found: the, you know, you imagine you're writing an algorithm. Let's say it's some, oh, I don't know, some numerical computation algorithm, and you're going to write it in a low-level language. Okay, you. Uh, you know, and, but some point in that algorithm, you say, gosh, if only I could do some algebraic analysis of what's going on, or if only I could use some piece of graph theory. Well, you don't do it if you're writing in a low-level language because it's just too hard to get that done. Yep, yep. What ends up happening in our language and what's been probably the last decade or so, most of the algorithms that we've produced, uh, and we create a lot of algorithms, their building blocks are these very sophisticated things. And the fact that those building blocks are kind of freely available is critical to having much a much more sophisticated level of algorithm than you could achieve if you were building it kind of from the sand. And people, and by the way, the, the whole question of is it efficient? The answer is, gosh, you know, if you're doing, let's say, solving a traveling salesman problem or something, you know, we have the world's best traveling salesman, pro, you know, problem algorithms. Mm-hmm. You don't have to go. You know, if you were writing that from scratch, you'd never use the world's best such algorithms because it'd be a big pain to try and figure out how to do that. Yep, yep. Um, and, uh, you know, then the question is, how good can our compilers be? And 
that's a, you know, cause that's the big, big thing, you know, back in the day, people used to say when, when I started doing computing, people would say, oh, you know, if you're doing something serious, you've got to write an assembly language, you know, these languages like C, they're, they're just, they're crazily inefficient. Um, and, but of course that's not true anymore because, you know, optimizing compilers typically will do better than a human writing most kinds, yeah, most, yep. most humans in most situations. It's just not a good idea to write the assembly code or, yourself. Or even another way of looking at it is is the the limiting fa the limiting factor now is is the person's time and energy. You know the the people th those are the that's the commodity that doesn't scale. You can get a really large data center, but you can't necessarily take someone's mental model and 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 replicate it to ten thousand people, right? Yeah, right. But but I think more than that, and the you know what happens. You know, because we've built this kind of sort of language at a different level than people have tried to build languages before, th what we what happens there is there's just much more stuff automated. So people who end up getting fluent in the language can just be much more productive. They can write, you know, it might take, you know, five lines of orphan language code or it might take, you know, 200 lines of some other language. But by the way, the, uh, you know, calling on five libraries that you then have to figure out, well, are they really going to work and so on and so on and so on. So, you know, I, I completely agree. I mean, what, you know, one of the things about Wolfen language is, you know, I've, my original idea is, you know, pander to the humans, not to the computers. You know, back in 30 years ago or more, particularly when I was starting this, everybody was saying, oh, you have to make it easy for the computer. I'm mm -hmm. saying, no, actually, you know, make it as easy as possible for the humans. And, and, the, and the ultimate version of that is find a way for the humans as easily as possible to express what they want in computational terms. And then it's up to us, the implementers, to try and make that run as efficiently as possible. And, you know, it's, it's lots of work. And, you know, like we're just building a very elaborate new layer of compilation technology to basically take this sort of very high-level language representation of things and really, you know, turn it into LLVM and, you know, really have it grind all the way down, so to speak. Yeah, that makes sense. But then, I, I think so, so most people, um, let's say, like, they have, they have some system, maybe it's a service on the internet or maybe it's an app or it's, it's a website or something like that. And, and so they can um, interoperate with with wolfram language but you're saying that that you know over time uh wolfram language can eventually be used to drive you know apps and uis oh, and things sure. like that. yeah and it is right now i mean it's used in in lots of large-scale enterprise applications they are just running wolfram language code i mean they have some web server in the front end and then behind it is you know let's say a private version of our cloud technology and it's just running you know wolfram language code and that's you know there's 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 lots of that it's it's kind of always funny to me you know i go to oh, i don't know you know i go to a pharmacy and i pick up a prescription and i realize oh my gosh it's our technology that actually created you know the thing that i'm seeing here that went from you know the the doctor's prescription you know written out to the kind of symbolic representation that's used to compute all kinds of things about uh, you know multiple drugs or whatever and to compute you know the schedule and you know in the end that label it's probably, you know, there's probably some piece of orphan language code that made that label, so to speak. It's <laughs> That's a weird cool. thing in the world because, you know, in, in, you know, there's an awful lot of stuff now that, uh, you know, in the past there was a lot of stuff where the R&D was done with, with our language. Now there's an increasing amount of stuff where the actual deployment is done with our language. But it's a strange thing. As a, as a language designer, you know, you realize, gosh, it's, it's our technology underneath there. And it's like, and so what? I'm still, you know, standing in line picking this thing up, and it doesn't make any difference. The, um, I mean, it's, it's. Uh, I also find it interesting. Uh, you know, the flip side of that. You know, I, 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 I'm interested in sort of education, and we should talk about that a bit because I think there's some, some, some worthwhile things to say about about that. But, mm -hmm. but um, so I end up uh, quite often, you know, talking to groups of kids and things like that, and um, a lot of them use Wolf Alpha. And they kind of, you know, they notice my name, they know about Wolfram Alpha, and there's this moment of surprise when they realize that there's a person who is connected to this thing that exists on the internet and that they use every day. 
Um, That's right. Think, it, there's a real yeah. building and set of people behind behind all of these websites. They're not just ephemeral. Right, right. And it's like, like there's a human and somebody decided to do this and somebody actually built it. Yeah. How is um, Wolfram and, Alpha answering questions when you're here? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Right. There, we, we did that as an April Fool gag at one point. We had a handwriting output from the thing and we had, uh, we had a whole backstory about that. Nice. But, um, the, um, but I think the, um, uh, you know, in terms of, of sort of the, the, educational aspects of things i mean that this this whole question about um you talked about you know what's what's the right way to do things is the right way to have computers kind of come and understand human natural language or is the right way for humans to get to the point where they can express things in a more computationally precise way and i think the thing you know i was, was talking about sort of the, the literacy transition 500 years ago um there will be another such transition and it will be a transition where people can, where the typical person understands computational language. And I like to think that the things I've spent much of my life building will contribute to that, that, um, uh, you know, that people will understand enough computational language that they can routinely express themselves in that way. They can write that little contract. They can define, uh, you know, they can they can, you know, the, the restaurant menu will be in computational language and they can say, well, actually, I want to make a, a change to this. Let me, you know, change that piece of code, so to speak. That makes um, sense. It's sort of like solving a maze by, you know, beginning at the start and the finish and working your way to the middle. You know, if, 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 we, if we make it way too open-ended for the people, then there's just too much ambiguity. Um, on the flip side, you know, we can't expect everyone to write C code um, to, to order a hamburger, right? But, yeah, but there's right. probably a spot in the middle where where people think and, and act, uh, people interface with computers um, with much more unconscious knowledge, similar to right now how we can use algebra almost unconsciously. And, yeah, uh, yeah. and, and that will help, will help the whole process tremendously. Right, no, I, I think that's, you know, as I say, the, the, you know, language design is a curious kind of art because it isn't, it's not like, it's it's all about kind of um, trying to think about how people think about things it's it's not it's not like doing basic science where you are purely trying to do something abstract um and you have to be sort of you have to be thinking about how does this relate to sort of what people care about how people think about things and so on and i think in um uh you know one of the things that's really neat right now is that uh, well, through the technology we built, the you know the the world's fanciest you know research scientists and so on, uh, you know a very large collection of them use our technology to to do their work every day, and it turns out that exact same technology is now perfectly accessible to you know middle school type kids who can learn sort of to express themselves computationally in our language. And who can, by the way, do things in the language that they immediately care about. So it's not just this kind of abstract exercise of, you know, uh, write a program that sorts numbers or something. Right. They can say, uh, you know, let's take movie posters of, of uh, you know, the popular movies of the last year. And let's find out whether red is becoming a more popular color or whatever it is. We always um, laugh about the... Um... Uh, you know, if, if someone's uh, applying to be a data scientist or, or, you know, which is basically Silicon Valley's version of just statistician, right? But but if mm -hmm. someone's applying for one of these roles, they'll do a, a coding interview where they'll have to sort a list or invert a binary tree or something like that. And um, it, it's kind of funny to see someone with, say, 20 years of experience, you know, inverting a binary tree. And it's just kind of a running joke. But but um, maybe maybe that's because there's sort of this inertia and maybe something better would be, you know, using a language that, that allows you to fetch a lot of information and solving a much more high level problem. Right. And, and right. So, I mean, like you know, that, a typical you, you one that, that, um, that we've used a few times is, is, um, okay, you're given a lat long coordinate on the earth and you're going to produce a map. There's a real problem in Wolfram Alpha. You're going to produce a map what's the default map scale that you should use given that you're throwing a particular lat long coordinate on the earth? Okay, if the lat long coordinate lands in the middle of the Pacific, you obviously don't want to show a one mile radius map. If the you know, lat long coordinate lands in the middle of Manhattan, you probably don't want to show a 1,000 you know, uh, kilometer 
you know, radius map. Yeah. And so the question is, what do you actually do? And so the answer might be, well, you look at the population density, you look at the actual imagery in the map, you try and figure out density of that. That's kind of typical sort of computational thinking problem. And the whole point of our language is once you can define what you want, like you say, I, I care about population of people, I care about, you know, the entropy of the um, of the actual map features, or I care about, you know, you can invent lots of different kinds of things, then it becomes pretty easy to express those things and to, you know, try out your algorithm. And that's a very different kind of exercise than the typical kind of computer science, uh, you know, uh, sort of list type thing. Um, it's a, it involves different kind of thinking. And by the way, it's thinking which is not really taught much in a lot of computer science education. I mean, this idea of let's just think computationally about real problems in the world, that's not what ends up being in those computer science exercises. I mean, what, one of the things that is my biggest fear, actually, about modern computer science education, uh, particularly at the K through 12 level, is that it'll go the same way as things have gone with math. I mean, what happens with what happened with math, you know, most people's takeaway from studying math in school is I don't like math. It's right. kind of boring. It's very, you know, it's it's intricate. It's mechanical. It's kind of why do I care? Like I've I've asked many kids of you know with quite uh, you know quite sophisticated kids I say the math you've learned in school have you used it anywhere and they're like well uh, well uh, no and that's you know that's kind of that, so they learnt it as a oh well I've got to you know do my algebra calculus whatever and I'm doing that as a as a sort of separated abstract thing. And it's it's something where I'm I'm going through the mechanics of it. I'm learning how to factor a polynomial, how to do an integral, whatever. That's like to the, to the horror of particularly one of my kids. Yeah, one of the, one of the I, things that that cracked me up when I was taking the SAT as, as a teenager was um, there was a question where um, somebody had 17 watermelons and they were at a grocery store and and the answer ended up being 17 and it was just I found that hilarious because I just pictured this person with 17 watermelons you know, in a shopping cart in a grocery yeah. store. And that is this that is the stereotypical math problem. It's just it it you know, even in that environment where you had every opportunity to put, I don't know, something, I don't know, uh uh bottles of water or something, but they chose something even more absurd than that. And it just shows right. how disconnected it is from anything real. Right. I mean look, I think that the uh, a couple of comments about that, but 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 I think, you know, programming, low level programming I think is the enemy of computational thinking in education. That is, if what you do is teach people how to write quick sort, you are, uh, and maybe you don't even get to that level, but you know, if you write them, if you teach them how to, uh, I don't know. Do a uh, for loop or something. Yes, right. You know, most people will find that kind of boring. Some people who might go on to be systems programmers will find that super interesting. And that's great. And, you know, but most people, just like all those people who won't go on to be pure mathematicians and who find a lot of the, you know, algebra stuff kind of boring, will will similarly be turned off computation by being fed this kind of very, you know, uh, very low level kind of why do I care type stuff. And I think, you know, computer science education has gone through about four waves over time. You know, the, the basic wave, that, which was one of the better ones, by the way, and then a series of other waves. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it, you know, one of the things that, you know, I put a fair amount of effort into, although education is such a fragmented area, it's so hard to, to know really, uh, you know, to, to, to well, uh, it, it's easier in smaller countries, actually, where there's more central kind of decision making but but in a country like the US it's really hard to you know to you know to to sort of put effort and get commensurate res returns mm -hmm. but it it's some um, you know this this thing about okay let's teach computational thinking and let's teach it by having people be able to sort of form computational ideas and and then make it up to the job of the implementers like us to make it so that you know, what the kids, you know, to make it as easy as possible for the kids to actually get computational results. And it's like, you know, if if the kids are getting the syntax wrong, that's not because the kids are stupid. It's because we haven't given the right user assistance prompts to make sure that they don't get the syntax wrong. Um, yep. You know, I think it's the, the um, uh, whereas in math, 
you don't get to do that. You don't get to have, you know, somebody thinking about how do we provide, you know, algebra is algebra, and you don't get to say, oh, let's, you know, we're trying to automate this as much as possible so that the humans just have to do the real thinking part. It's just like, well, no, actually, you have to, you know, add, you know, X and X and get two X and all that kind of thing, and then you have to do that yourself. And I think, um, so, you know, I think there's a, there's an, uh, there's a, an important thing that that happens in in, in education. There, I mean, it's, it's for me, it's it's interesting. We we um, uh, so we we run a, um, a summer camp for high school students, and we also have a summer school for sort of grown ups that we've been doing now for sixteen years. Um, that uh, uh, where people come and you know do some original project that's never been done before, and they've uh, often never done a project where you go from sort of nothing. And actually create something, and it's really, it's really great with the you know with the tools that we have now. It has become there's there's an awful lot of low hanging fruit out there. I mean, there's an awful lot of stuff where using, you know, using our language, using the whole sort of computational paradigm. There are there are things that people can do. You know, a high school kid can come in and in two weeks actually produce something really 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 neat. You can, you know, there's a website with all kinds of projects on it that. that that kids have done, but, but um, uh, you know, that's something that is, you know, it's a thing of our times that that's possible. And I think that uh, I find it particularly, you know, for me, it's particularly cool to see that, you know, these kids are able to make use of the same tools that kind of the fanciest, you know, research scientists are using, and they're able to go find things that uh, you know, are, are, are interesting new things, so to speak. Yeah, l- let's talk about, about that for a minute on the accessibility side. So so this is something we actually haven't mentioned on the show, but um, it, the vast majority of languages are just you know, completely public, open source, and, and totally accessible. And, and the way that the people who put their time and effort into those languages you know, support themselves is usually through some type of enterprise contract. So for example, um, Java becomes really popular. Uh, Java is probably not a good example. Uh, let's say Python. No, it's terrible. It's, it's yeah. an example of the disaster of what you're, <laughs> yeah. what you're describing. Yeah, it's like I immediately regret my decision. Uh, uh, yeah, so, so Python gets really popular. Um, you know, anyone can go and download the source code and look at all of it. So in, in a sense, the intellectual property is 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 you know the value there is questionable but then you know some enterprise customer starts using it and and now they need to reduce their risk because they have a risk of something bad happening uh you know with their system that's 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 a fault of python itself and so to reduce their risk they they spend money and that's really what keeps that whole process moving now i know for for um mathematica and i haven't to be totally fair, kept totally up to date on Wolfram language. But I, but I know for Mathematica, it, it it's similar to, to MATLAB in the sense that it costs money to sort of even even enter and start using it. And so, uh, yeah, how does that work? If if someone's a student, um, how do they how do they get started? Um, and sort of what's sort of I guess the business model to some degree, and and how does how does that sort of work operationally? Right. Well, I mean, so you know, I've been interested my whole life in kind of threading the needle. Of figuring out how to do the most interesting, innovative stuff for the world, and have that be sustainable over the long term. Okay, and I think I'm not doing too badly in the sense that you know we've been able to consistently be building you know a technology stack for the last 32 years. It's interesting that when I started this, the first company, you know, the first thing I built, I was originally going to sort of do the open source thing. I realized, gosh, there's no way to. That was in 19 in 1981. Um, there's no way to support this. I have to start a company. I started a company of a certain kind, you know, venture capital funded and so on. That didn't work out that well. I mean, the company eventually did an IPO and did okay, but, but um, uh, you know, it didn't work out well in terms of having a long-term sustained vision. For the last 32 years, I've been pretty lucky in that I have, a, you know, a smallish private company, only 800 people, mostly R&D folk, um, and we've been able to kind of keep innovating and building things. Now, you know, the problem that we have, namely, you know, build this huge computational language that has everything in it. It's not just one of these, oh, I'm going to spend the weekend and come out with a new language right. and throw it out on GitHub type thing. Right? It's a thing which is a sustained, you know, in this case, 32-year story. 
and it's a story where you know I'm I was pretty pleased you know in the 30th anniversary of Mathematica I thought oh let me see whether I can take code that I wrote 30 years ago and there it was on a you know on a, an original Mac and I could get it off with floppies and things like that I take this code this was just last, last um, uh, few months ago take this code with great effort I get it off the floppy and onto a modern computer and by golly it just runs in the latest version of Orphan Language. So cool. you know, we have 30 year compatibility and, and you know, people, a lot of people in sort of the research world really appreciate this. I mean, they, you know, they have stuff that they did, you know, 25 years ago and it just works. And, you know, I think that the, um, the idea that, so, you know, my main goal has been sort of thread the needle of being able to do sustained innovative work for a long period of time and try and deliver something valuable to the world while letting as many people as possible use it and have the ecosystem work. And, you know, we've done a variety of different things. So, for example, you know, basically every major university in the U.S. at least and most, most around the world has a site license for our technology. So for anybody at a university, it's free. I mean, the, the, the uh, you know, the university is effectively paying an enterprise license, but that means every individual student and so on gets it for free. Nice. So they in, put in, in their the, EDU email address or something like that? Yeah. I mean, it, uh, it, it, supposedly the universities have ways that they distribute all these things. But yes, and, and that's basically what happens. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, now Wolfram Alpha, the main Wolfram Alpha is just free to the world. Uh, there's, a, there's a version, there's a pro version that students... Uh, uh, some students, well, a lot of students end up getting because it has some additional capabilities like showing steps and so on for computations. Um, but, you know, Wolfram Alpha, the idea was just make it free for the world. Now, you know, then obviously we have an API that's what gets used by folks like Apple and Amazon and so on. Um, and, uh, the, um, and we have enterprise versions and, and all this kind of thing. But that's, a, you know, that, that's one model. Now, in terms of Wolfram Language, uh, this is sort of interesting, actually. I mean, the 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 um, uh, you know, I have a very strong belief that one wants to have the the source of of funding for something be as aligned as possible with you know where the value is coming from, is 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 going, so to speak. So, in other words, that makes sense. It's, yeah. like, it's like you know, the people who are actually going to use this seriously should be you know, if they believe in it and they're going to pay for it then I want, and I don't want something where it's like, well, we'll make a free version, um, but we're really going to make our money off support. So let's not make the free version too good. Let's make the thing a little bit cockeyed so that we can make <laughs> money from support, yeah. which is unfortunately what's happened. Or, you know, or let's make everything free and get people, a lot of people to use it and then say, oh, whoops, we got some patents on this. You know, you have to pay up lots of money because you're using our patents. Yeah, you know, especially when it comes uh, to documentation. I mean, it's, it's, it's like every line of documentation that you provide with your open source language is, is, is literally taking revenue away from your business model, which is to support people who are trying to use undocumented code. Yeah, I mean, look, my, my point of view is, I just want, I, I mean, you know, I've tried to operate in a sense, a very sort of, uh, uh, you know, a, a straightforward business, so to speak. I mean, we're, you know, what we try to do is, you know, continue to innovate and produce, you know, the best language we can. Of course, we, the fact that we're doing this in a, an ultimately commercial way allows us to make use of all these data sources and all these other kinds of things, which there's no way they would say, you know, if we said, oh, we're going to give everything away to everybody, they'd say, well, you can't give our stuff away. So, you know, so forget having, you know, financial data or something. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, so, you know, it's part of the ecosystem that one has to have, you know, everybody, it, it has to be a sort of a, a, a thing. Uh, the other thing is, there's the question of how do you maintain coherence? I mean, in, in um, you know, that's been my personal commitment, so to speak, for the last, you know, three decades or so, is actually try and keep this language con co consistent. And you know, do do sort of unified development, and I think, you know, in in um, uh, you know, it requires leadership to do that. Um, I think, well, like like Python, I I gather recently had 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 trouble with that because, um, you know, it's like by the time if if uh, you know, in our case, I'm you know, 
in in a position where I'm actually trying to lead this now. Th there's the question of um, uh, the question of source code. I actually don't really care whether you know. I mean, our source code isn't sort of publicly out on the internet. That's you know, that's not something I care that much about, and I don't think anybody else cares that much about it either. Yeah. You know, actually, yep. for a decade, we actually had a large chunk of code, source code, out. You know, freely available. And um, the thing that was really funny was, and you know, we, we were doing this because we thought, oh, people are going to be interested in all these mathematical algorithms. Isn't that cool type thing? Mm -hmm. um, and it turned out when we finally did a sort of an assessment, did anybody care? We discovered that a large swath of comments in the code were in Russian. Okay. It happened, it happened that the people who were working on it were, it was, you know, the people who, who natively speak Russian who, who work on this stuff for, for us. And um, uh, it's like, nobody read this for a decade. You know, we had it out there. Nobody read this because yep. somebody was said, oops, your comments are in Russian. Yeah, I think um, the, the open source model makes sense uh, when it's low level. So, for example, um, uh, you know, an operating system, you know, if, if, if the operating system is not open source, then... Um, there's a worry that, you know, I won't be able, one day I won't be able to use my mouse or something like that. You could always write well, some interface yeah. driver. But for something like Mathematica, I, I agree. I mean, if I had to guess, I would guess that the source code is less important. What's more important is that somebody can can make uh, uh, make Wolfram language a part of their process. So, if, right. Yeah. Right. And I mean, so, so what we're trying to do, I mean, so, you know, I think we have a pretty good record of, you know, three decades of, of you know, stable, compatible, uh, you know, development, which I think is pretty impressive on the scale of languages. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, what, you know, what I want to do, you know, my goal is to have our language prosper, you know, forever, so to speak. And, you know, what's the best way to do that? You know, I, I, you know, don't know precisely, but but obviously, you know, we want to set it up so that, you know, whatever happens to our company, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, the language will always be available, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Actually, a thing we're 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 doing is um, uh, so the Wolfram engine, which is kind of the the, the core computational kernel of the language, um, we're actually going to be. Uh, 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 changing the way that's licensed so that it's much easier for people to incorporate it in things. And basically the deal there is going to be, uh, if you're developing stuff, you can just use the engine for free. You can just download it for free. You can use it for free. As soon as you want a production license, if you want to actually go into production, you know, running some big commercial site, then, then you pay us. But while sense. you're just using, you know, using the thing to play around. Now, you know, if your product is R&D that's you know that's our traditional market and that's you know that doesn't count as software development um but if you're if your goal is you know I'm developing this I'm playing around with it I'm trying to develop some product um then you know then it's just uh you know the the is a version that's you know free for developers and I think the um you know I don't know exactly how that's going to work out but the well, way I just to, you're you're walking in some good footsteps there because that's what the business model of um uh, Unity, so so Unity, yes, you know, will give you almost yeah. everything, but then as soon as you want to make a commercial product, now in the case of Unity, you know, they have a little bit more control, um, just because everyone has to at the end of the day package uh, their their game in a certain way, uh, you know. But I still I still think that this business model makes sense. The other thing that people don't really give a full appreciation to is just the. The, and I might not be saying this correctly, but the, the sort of private charitable nature of, of people. I mean, the vast majority of people recognize value and and will, will pay for things, um, yeah. especially Look, if they're also making money, you know, if it's part of their commercial right. process. I mean, you know, my attitude is there's, um, you know, when we give away, you know, our software to lots of, you know, students and and you know, lots of different groups and so on, but like on the Raspberry Pi computer, you know, there's a Wolfram language bundled on every Raspberry Pi computer, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, freely available to people. And, you know, there are lots of things like that. You know, my goal is to make sure that the people who are really deriving value, and that value might be, you know, doing the next great R&D thing, that value might be teaching a class, 
that value might be you know delivering a product the people who are really deriving what ends up being commercial value um you know support the continued development of what we're doing and you know i mean it's it's been uh you know it's it's a it's a complicated sort of threading of the needle because you know i personally you know you know if 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 we had infinite commercial resources maybe we'd be able to just give it away to everybody but i actually think that isn't even healthy i think it's good to have a, a situation where the people you know who are benefiting are the people who are supporting continued development yep and you know that allows us i mean it makes us it makes us do things that actually makes sense for the world so to speak that's right i mean it's sort of like uh, if you were to play one of these simulation video games like sim city or something like that and you give yourself infinite money then all of a sudden the the game becomes completely unguided um, uh -huh. and so you you have no direction unless you have some customers yeah the the, the later versions of sim city actually were um the uh uh, uh, a bunch of it was designed in Wolfram language. Was, oh, cool! Uh, I didn't know that. Uh, the, the, that's just one of those. Uh, just uh, you know, and I think um, uh, you know the, the the you know the rules. I, I don't know exactly all the things that were done there. I've I've, I've seen a bunch of the um, uh, the simulations of the the simulations of the simulations of cities. So to speak. <laughs> right. I um, saw an interesting were... article about how not to go on too much of a tangent, but but how they decided on the the traffic model and effectively it's a monte carlo approach where they at every time step they randomly pick uh you know two different zoned places so for example a, a residential zoned place and then a commercial zone place and they draw a path using the roads that the 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 um player has placed um and then and then they also then decrease everything by a constant so that they always have a, a a distribution a probability distribution and over time if many of those paths require the the person to take the same road then that naturally that becomes sort of a very nice mathematical model of the traffic and and to do anything like that you need to try many different ideas yeah, i'm i'm, I'm quite certain that that was prototyped in, in mathematical or morphine language um, just knowing knowing the team that was involved in doing that, it's um, actually I, I have to tell a personal story about traffic flow, which is kind of a so uh, when I was a kid, I was sort of interested in traffic flow as kind of a, a, a interesting kind of mathematical type problem. And I, you know, didn't really ever figure out terribly much that's interesting about it. Then I started working on these things called cellular automata. They're very simple programs that um, uh, we just have a you know row of black and white cells, and you just have a rule that says you know if there's a black cell to the right and a white cell in the middle and a et cetera, then do this. And you know the the main thing that I discovered about about things like cellular automata is it's very easy to get very complicated behavior even when the rules are very simple. Mm -hmm. And that turns out to you know I I wrote this 1,200 page book called A New Kind of Science that is based on that idea that actually just today came out in paperback so after 16 years of being a pure hard hardcover book but oh cool that, I, I i digress um, is it the, on the, uh, on um uh, kindle or anything like that oh yeah and there's actually a free version on the web um, cool it's a very enough. very elaborate version on the web which 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 um and i've been slowly taking oh this is this is a fun fun story so all all the you know the science for that book um the book came out in 2002 but all the science that i spent the, the decade before that, working on for that book, it's all in Wolfram language notebooks, um, and uh, so I wanted to sort of expose all that stuff. And so I've been just recently, actually, I've been doing. Uh, um, it's ended up that it ends up being me who has to do a bunch of the stuff because I kind of understand the code I wrote before. But um, uh, uh, so I've been live streaming some of these things, and I've been taking these notebooks that I made, you know, in 1992 and things like this. And it's really satisfying because they just run. You know, I, I just start them up and, you know, press shift enter and the code just, just runs. And some of it can be better now because we have, you know, cleaner sort of uh, functions that where, you know, we've used sort of higher levels of abstraction to define how, how certain kinds of things work. So the code can be shorter and clearer. Sure. But it's pretty neat that the, you know, that all this sort of research notebooks that I had all just run. But in any case, I, I digress. I, I was talking about road traffic flow. So, so I studied these cellular automata and things, and then years went by. And, you know, I had sort of failed in my youth to be able to 
do much with road traffic flow. Um, and then, uh, you know, then somebody said, by the way, there's the cellular automaton model that people have developed of road traffic flow. And actually, it turns out the standard model now is a cellular automaton model based on a thing called Rule 184, which is the, well, the 184th rule in this enumeration of rules that I made. And so it's like, uh, uh, it's it's kind of amusing for me because that's that's become, as I say, the standard model that people use for uh, for road traffic flow, and and there it was, sort of right under my nose, yeah. with the cellular automata that I that I studied, and I I um, uh, but you know it, it's it's actually if one's interested in sort of the meta theory of modeling, it's actually an interesting story because what really happened and what always happens with modeling is modeling is an idealization. So you say I'm going to model snowflake growth. You might say, what really matters to me is exactly how fast the, the, the edges of the snowflake expand. But the fact that my snowflakes are circular, I don't care about that. I really just care about how fast the, the edges expand. Or I might say, what I really care about is the overall structure of the snowflake, and I don't care whether I get exactly right how fast the edges expand. So modeling is always as much about what you care about as it is about you know, you're never going to get all the details right because models are always an idealization. And it's it's a little bit like what we were talking about a while back about sort of, um, you know, what's interesting, so to speak, you know, and, and the fact that that's very culturally dependent, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And so what really happened with this road traffic flow thing is that the things I thought were important about road traffic flow turned out not to be the things that are important. And what the model, what this cellular automaton model captures is a bunch of stuff that I really wasn't focused on. I was focused on various quantitative things that it doesn't capture, but what it does capture is the stuff that really matters for, you know, modeling self-driving, you know, modeling, uh, you know, current traffic jams and the effects of self-driving cars on them and all, all that kind of thing. Um, but in any case, I, I think, um, uh, I think that was a digression. But, no, um, I mean, one of the nice things about doing something, uh, you know, such as inventing a language or doing something, uh, you know, in the pure math space or, or publishing a paper in graph theory or one of these things is that is that it has just really wild implications that get realized over many years. Um, I found out recently some research that I had done as a student went into just figuring out the mass of a quark. And, and I know absolutely nothing about physics. That's interesting. Um, I, yeah, and, and that's, I'm curious what that was. I, I, I you know, uh, my only... So I worked on particle physics when I was a teenager, actually. And um, uh, it was, it's, it's interesting in terms of sort of the meta theory of fields, because I worked on particle physics in the late 1970s, when it was kind of the golden age of particle physics, and a bunch of new methodology had come in. And there was this like five year period when just there was major new result every two weeks type thing, mm -hmm. kind of the same way that machine learning is today. Yep. Uh, and uh, uh, and so what's what's interesting about being involved in a field during its kind of golden age of of hyper growth is that you know there's there's low hanging fruit lying all over the place, and so you know I invented this thing um, uh, this way of studying the structure of of particle events uh, at a particle accelerator, and I was I was um, uh, you know, which I did when I was like 17 years old or something. And I was, uh, I was really pleased that, you know, when the Higgs particle was discovered, you know, they'd used um, uh, these, uh, you know, as part of the, the, uh, the kind of the pipeline of doing the analysis and so on. They used these things called event shapes that I, that I'd invented. So that was, you know, th that, that's the, that's the benefit of being involved in a field during its sort of hyper growth phase. The, the, you know, from a sort of career planning point of view, the downside is, You've got a lot of competition yep. during that period. I mean, if you, you know, I personally tend to prefer working on things where, uh, you know, I can do neat stuff, but nobody else cares. And you know, <laughs> and after after it's done, you know, I mean, my favorite thing, in a sense, is producing what I tend to call alien artifacts, things that nobody kind of thought would exist. But, you know, once it exists, you can look at it and you can realize it's interesting. So like Wolfram Alpha, I consider to be an example of kind of an alien artifact. Like people hadn't, you know, people had, well, they kind of tried to do question answering stuff for years, but they had not, uh, they didn't have knowledge bases, they didn't have symbolic languages underneath them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It hadn't really gone anywhere. Yeah, and I think the thing that I noticed about Wolfram Alpha is it's sort of a blending of two things. So, so you know, there had been expert systems like I talked about, you know, OpenPsych, and and there had, there had been, you know, there's uh, WordNet, 
there had been these sort of prologue, obviously driving a lot of that. There had been these these systems, but they were far too rigid, right? And then on the other end, you have something like like Google.com, which is extremely open ended, um, but entirely data driven, and there's no uh, there's no structure and there's no human intuition behind those results, right? And so I felt yeah. like Wolfram Alpha sort of walked that line very well. Yeah, I think, I mean, uh, you know, you mentioned things like Psych. Uh, you know, Psych is a, isn't, uh, you know, I, I had known Doug Lanat, the guy who created Psych yep. from back in the early 80s. Um, and so I watched that whole progress. And it was, it was, you know, I have to say, it was interesting because, you know, when, when Wolfram Alpha came out, it was... You know, AI was at one of its a real low point. I mean, people didn't really believe AI. You know, 2009, AI was not. You know, people said you're working on AI. It's like, oh, that's not going anywhere, type thing. Yep, I literally, and, uh, you know, my background is in is in deep neural networks, and uh, in 2009, I um, got a job writing JavaScript because nobody needed someone who knew anything about neural networks. <laughs> oh, that's good. That's, that's a, yeah. So you're a data point. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I think, I mean, it was interesting when, when, when Wolf Malfa was coming out, I, I had a friend named Marvin Minsky, who was a sort of pioneer of the yeah. AI world. Um, and, you know, I saw Marvin, oh, probably a few weeks before Wolf Malfa went live. And I said, Marvin, let me show you something. Right. It's like uh, I said, it's a, you know, it's a question answering system among other things. And it's like, okay. And so, you know, type a couple of things in and then Marvin, you know, changes the subject, wants to talk about something different. I said, no, Marvin, this time it actually works. <laughs> and then he's, you know, then he's like, oh, well, let me try something else. Let me try something else. Oh, wow. You know, and he's like, this was, it was, it was interesting to see because he really, you know, he'd seen so many kind of fake question answering systems over the course of many years. He just, decided it was impossible. And, you know, why were we able to succeed? Basically, for, uh, I didn't really even understand this until sort of after the fact. I mean, as far as I was concerned in building Wolfram Alpha, it was just, you know, use what, you know, cleverness I might have and use, you know, uh, and just do a bunch of engineering. But after the fact, I realized, uh, you know, a couple of things. First of all, we had a lot of actual knowledge and people have been trying to do natural language understanding and so on without knowledge they've been trying to abstractly do it it's just like what's the structure you know let's parse the sentence and find the noun and the verb and so on that's much much less relevant than knowing this is a city and its population is roughly this and so on and and that's why you know that's why it's likely to be talking about springfield massachusetts rather than springfield you know illinois or something like this Mm -hmm. um and the second thing was which i is that we actually had a target to turn the natural language into. Namely, we had our symbolic language that could represent things about the world. And another thing that, again, only became sort of clear after the fact is that a bunch of the, uh, well, ideas about algorithm, uh, what one might call algorithm discovery that came out of my uh, new kind of science project, um, we used that a lot in building the way that Wolf Malfa works. I mean, you know, the, the, just to say something about that, I mean, the, you know, the traditional way to think about building software is or has been, um, uh, you know, let's write the lines of code to do what we want to do. What I ended up discovering from sort of just looking at, you know, trillions of simple programs is that there are simple programs that do really interesting things. And sometimes those things are really useful. They might be good pseudo random number generators. They might be good image processing things and so on. And so we started developing this kind of methodology for just finding algorithms by knowing what kind of a thing you want and then just going out and searching the space of possible programs. I mean, in today's world, that seems less surprising because with with deep learning and so on, one's sort of doing the same kind of thing. Although what what we've done a lot more of is just exhaustively going out and sampling the computational universe Whereas in, in typical neural nets, you're doing this kind of incremental sort of uh, more like uh, biological evolution, you know, small taking small steps and trying to make sure the animals don't die on the way type thing um, yeah, rather yeah. than just sampling the whole space. But, but you know, I think that the um, but to, to go back to the sort of the the um, uh, things about common sense reasoning and so on. Uh, so, you know, this project called Psych, which was an attempt to represent uh, to use essentially predicate logic to represent 
uh, sort of facts about the world, common sense facts about the world. You know, uh, if uh, something is dunked in water, then it is wet. Those kinds of things. Right. Um, the uh, uh, when Wolfram Alpha came out, uh, you know, Doug Lennart said basically, "Well, you succeeded in what I tried to do," and 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 you know, and the the whole sort of common sense reasoning thing clearly wasn't able to get there. What I realized was a sort of interesting conceptual point, which is, in a sense, what Doug was trying to do was to use uh, the state of sort of uh, human thinking in the medieval time, in, in the Middle Ages. And I just cheated and used the last 300 years of science. Because for him, you know, if he wants to figure out some physics problem with common sense reasoning, he's like, oh, well, you know, if you push on this, then it'll push on that, which will make this happen. And it's kind of like you're reasoning through it, like you're doing natural philosophy to figure out what's going to happen in the world. For us, it's like, well, let's just, you know, just use all that science that people have figured out. Let's just, you know, for the physics problem, let's turn that into, you know, Lagrangian mechanics and solve the differential equations and say, and the answer is 7.5 or something. Um, so essentially, we're you know, we're making use of all that additional knowledge that's been developed in, in civilization beyond uh, the pure human reasoning knowledge. And I think that's what, you know, that's kind of, uh, you know, in a sense, we cheated relative to the original mission of kind of common sense AI. Um, but I, I think the, know, the, the fact that you have these dynamical systems and, and they don't is definitely part of it. But I think the other, the, the even more important part is is the resolving of the ambiguity Ultimately, through you know heuristics, but also through through statistics and through through language understanding, yeah, yeah, and things right. like that. No, no, right. I mean, look, it's just. I mean, as an engineering project, it's a. I mean, you know, our effort was much. Uh, you know, has been much more. I don't know, pragmatic and and in a sense, making use of many more methods. I mean, it, it, not just saying we're just going to use common sense reasoning to figure everything out. We're using whatever method makes sense. And, and that's kind of a story. You know, that's, that's part of the, kind of the whole Wolfram language story is put everything in so you can use whatever makes sense. I mean, you know, when we come to do data science, for example, the, the uh, uh, you know, we like to talk about kind of multi-paradigm data science. You know, it's just... Everything is there, so whatever makes sense to do, you can you can do, so to speak. Rather than, oh, we've got a package that does this, so you know, so that's what we're going to have to to do. But I was going to say, you know, you're talking. We were talking earlier about math problems and watermelons and 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 so on. And uh, one of the use cases that I really wanted to make use of sort of common sense reasoning for was math word problems. Um, so mm -hmm. uh, we. Um, uh, you know, I, and I, I, we still have never managed to do this. And, and it's, um, uh, you know, when you talk about, you know, putting the watermelons in your, in your shopping cart or whatever, and then, it, and then somebody might say, um, and, uh, uh, I don't know, um, after, well, let's say you put the watermelon, you know, um, uh, you know, you put the watermelons in bags in the shopping cart. And, uh, you know, if, if there are X number of, um, uh, watermelons go in these bags. How many of them are still uh, are are visible as you're walking around the store? Well, of course, to know that it will be visible when you're walking around the store, you have to know that once a watermelon has been put in a bag, you can't see it anymore, and that's kind of common sense reasoning. Mm -hmm. And so, to to do, you know, if you set up a word problem like that, you have to have a layer of common sense reasoning. You know, we might be able to if we if we can get an equation out of it, you know, three x plus seven equals fourteen or something, where x is the number of watermelons. Then you know, then we're all done, and we can just use you know modern science, so to speak, to just crack that and get the, to the answer. Right. But the thing about you know how many watermelons can you see in the shopping cart that we need common sense reasoning for. Now you know, I've been hoping. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, I've been hoping that that we'll be able to make use of what Doug has done for so many years. I mean, he 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 he's been very pessimistic about whether this is going to work. So so it's never been tried. But but um, uh, you know, and in fact, we've reached we can do basically up to middle school level math word problems using extremely boring heuristic templatey type techniques. Um, we can't do 
Uh, we can't do more sophisticated ones, and it's sort of an interesting open problem to be able to do those, and it's a place where one might be able to use, where one should be able to use, you know, common sense reasoning. But it's interesting to realize that that the the space where the space where there's sort of of things that one actually wants to do with sort of common sense reasoning is is still worth doing is a narrow space. And it's a space where in a sense, those things were built for humans to have to sort of uh, uh, put effort in to, to, to figure them out. They weren't, they're not natural things. I mean, you know, another example might yeah, be, that makes sense. you know, let's say you're doing medical school and you're saying, you know, which nerve goes near the such and such tendon you know, of such and such. Well, you could do that with common sense reasoning, but actually, you know, we've got a complete 3D map of human anatomy and you can just go and use computational geometry and answer the question. Um, and it's not, you know, even though a medical student might do it by thinking through, oh, you know, this goes that place and that place. And, and so they're, they're using common sense reasoning, but that's not how, how you know, we're going to do it with a, with, with a computer. It's interesting. It sounds like, you, so if you think about the these word problems, Ultimately, what they're trying to do is um, they're really trying to do two things. One is sort of obfuscate the the core problem, so they're not just giving you three x plus seven equals fourteen, mm -hmm. but but they're but they're wrapping it in some narrative that you have to understand. So they're making the problem harder, but then they're also um, trying to, to to relate the problem to real life, which is why it was so funny to see the the seventeen watermelons in one shopping cart. So. So in a sense, you know, if you could generate um, relevant, if you could generate, uh, you know, say SAT math questions that really connected with somebody, that, that would be, you know, maybe more difficult than the counting they would do at a real grocery store, but, but would, would, would closely emulate something they would do in real life. Um, I feel like there's something really profound there. So, I mean, because you've sort of, understood that it is truly a common sense reasoning problem you've understood the way the, the the routine things that people do and 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 the math that people do on a routine basis and you've been able to sort of extrapolate that to something more difficult like differential equations and figure out a way to sort of tie those two things together um that's actually right. something profoundly complex right i mean look i i think that the 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 thing one would like people to learn is the stuff they can't just feed to computers and get automated. And, you know, the main thing is this question of taking sort of a, a, a human thing you want to do and thinking about it in computational enough terms that you can, you know, describe it in a precise language and, and you know, have a computer unambiguously know what you're talking about. And I think that process, I mean, when you talk about like math word problems, you know, sort of the idea there is take these kind of fake situations in the world and try and mathematicize them. I think the, the, the real thing that people should be learning how to do, and, and very few people are actually learning this yet, is take things in the world that are real things in the world and learn how to think about them computationally and be able to express them in such a way that both you can think about them more clearly. I mean, the, the remarkable thing for me, at least, is, you know, I've been spending years kind of thinking about things computationally. And so there are lots of kinds of, uh, you know, very everyday questions where I think about them in terms of breaking it down into the kinds of, you know, structure that I would use to think about something computationally. And then by golly, I can actually get to an answer. And whereas otherwise you just don't have, it's, it's very mushy. You don't have a way to think about it. You know, if you don't have this, this kind of framework and in, in our case, you know, computational language to use to think about things, um, you, you know, you, you, you can't, you can't f form them precisely enough in your mind to actually get to a conclusion. I mean, it, it's, it's the same problem as, you know, Doug's common sense reasoning thing. You, you, you just, you end up, with you know you, you don't get uh, it's 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 kind of all um it's all these you know if it rains then it will get wet then this but it's all very kind of vague and it doesn't give you a you know a precise structure to 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 operate in um talking of which i i uh i think we're we're probably reaching <laughs> the end of my um uh i'm i'm a i'm a creature of you know one of the things i i i'm a data oriented person and so <laughs> yeah. i do um 
uh, I've, I've do a lot of sort of personal analytics stuff. And I probably, I was somewhat horrified a number of years ago to discover that I'm the human who's collected more data on themselves than anybody else. <laughs> um, and, uh, so one of the things I know is that I get, uh, I get sleepy at um, a very precise time, and that time was about ten minutes ago. <laughs> All right, so I'm, that so totally I'm makes start, sense. Uh, I'm going to start failing here, but but um, no, I think uh, that's great. So I, I wanted to. Um, I, I mean, this has been just absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much for 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 coming coming on the show. I think people are going to be absolutely fascinated um, to to hear a true programming language inventor and to to sort of hear your story and and this dialogue. I think it's it's been amazing. What about just to sort of you know, conclude here, like, um, you know, we always ask, um, two things. One is sort of, what is it like day to day at your company? Um, so in this case, you know, Wolfram research and, and are you hiring? If so, what kind of jobs are you hiring for? Where things like that? Okay. So, I mean, for me, I spend most of my time figuring stuff out. It's pretty neat, actually. It's, you know, I've, I've, uh, you know, it's, it's, I'm an unusual kind of CEO because I, um, uh, you know, I, I'm deeply involved in the design of the product and so on. And, uh, you know, I have, we've, we've got great people at the company. And so an awful lot of what happens at the company just happens and doesn't require, you know, uh, uh, the CEO to stick his nose into those things. And in fact, you know, in, in one thing that's been interesting the last year, but since we've been doing this live streaming of internal design review meetings, is that folks who want to know what it's like to work at our company, well, there's 250 hours of what a bunch of meetings are like that's uh, out there in the archives of the, of the live streamed um, uh, stuff. I think that, um, so our company is very geographically distributed where our headquarters is in Champaign, Illinois. I have been a remote CEO for 28 years. I live near Boston, um, and uh, uh, the although I happen to be tomorrow doing my about three times a year trip to, to Illinois, but but um, the um, uh, the thing that um, we we end up having people kind of scattered all over the world. Actually, there's 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 our HR department ten, tries to maintain an accurate map on our careers section of our website of where people are in the world. And it's quite, quite diverse, I would say. Um, cool. In terms of, of what, um, uh, you know, we, well, the places we, we tend to not hire people in, in New York and Silicon Valley because, you know, we're going to, you know, that's, um, that's super expensive for us. And it doesn't, um, uh, you know, we don't, we don't really need the, um, the proximity to other things that, um, that Silicon Valley provides. Not yep. that, I mean, it's, uh, um, I think, um, in terms of, you know, we've ended up with, uh, uh, well, I would say wonderfully talented group of people from around the world. Yeah. I know some I, I mean, folks, I really, uh, who, who work at Wolfram research who are in South Africa and, yes. um, yeah, yeah just, okay. it's amazing. Right. I mean, it's, um, you know, I think that the, um, the thing that, um, um, uh, you know, I, I really actually, I've, I've come to appreciate the sort of uh, the diversity of having people all over the world in all kinds of different um, uh, um, settings and situations and so on. It's, it's um, I think it adds a certain vibrancy to, to what happens that um, is, uh, is, is, is something I, I certainly appreciate. But it's, you know, we've ended up with, you know, lots of world experts on lots of kinds of things. We've had uh, you know, lots of people who've been at the company a very long time, and uh, uh, you know, some people they at the company for a decade, then they say, "Oh, the grass is greener somewhere else," and they go off somewhere else for a few years, and then they come back, which cool. um, is is always satisfying for it's satisfying for management to see that happen, so to speak. Yeah, definitely, because um, it, it means we're doing something right. But um, you know, I think that the thing that um, uh, we've ended up with. Um, uh, it's like people who are good at thinking are the people who tend to succeed because, you know, we have, we're always trying to solve, you know, a lot of what we're doing is stuff that's never been done before. And, you know, my principle in building the company is very similar to my principle in building our language, automate as much as possible. And so, you know, for me, you know, you mentioned JavaScript programming, you know, there was a period of time when we had tons of JavaScript programmers and it's like, 
look, guys, you know, what you're doing is, you know, why don't we build something higher level that just automates a bunch of this stuff? So we did that. Mm -hmm. And so then, you know, those folks, you know, moved on to doing other things. And, you know, and for us, it, uh, you know, they, they, they end up getting, um, you know, being able to, to work on sort of higher level things. And, um, and for the company, you know, that's how we get away with only having 800 people is by the fact that we've automated a huge amount of what goes on internal to the company. And, you know, we're, we're trying to, you know, we're using both the principles and the actual technology that we've built, you know, like our, oh, I don't know, um, you know, our testing system is, of course, all written in Wolfram language. Our, uh, one of the more exotic things that we're now doing is rating our ERP transaction processing system in Wolfram language because we just got fed up with, um, uh, actually, we got fed up with some of these pseudo open source uh, things which actually <laughs> end up costing way too much money. Yeah, and we yep. said these don't even work well. You know, let's just build our own. And um, uh, it's um, so you know, so that stuff is is um, now in terms of of uh, of hiring. You know, one of the uh, one of the things I I might mention is we have the summer school every year. It's usually about seventy people from around the world. Um, that's uh, a great collection of people. It's become a um, a favorite sort of pseudo vacation for a bunch of our uh, R&D folk. Um, and in fact, most of the instructors at the summer school are alumni of the summer school, which reveals the fact that the summer school is our, you know, as a single sort of, uh, you know, we, we recruit a lot of people from there. Um, cool. That makes sense. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it works really well because people come and, uh, you know, they, they often have never thought about, you know, working for the company. And they come and, you know, spend three weeks and they do a project and they get to know a bunch of people at the company and we get to see what they do. They get to see what uh, kind of, you know, our approach to doing things is. And it's kind of, uh, you know, it's uh, it's it's very um, uh, works well. But I think in terms of what are we what are we I mean, we're we're always looking for, you know, very talented people. I would say that my approach to management tends to be, you know, we've got a lot of projects we want to do. We've got a certain pool of, of people that, um, you know, have lots of talents and sort of the role of management is to solve the puzzle of how do you connect, you know, the talented people with the projects that you want to get done. And so we're more interested in kind of, uh, you know, really talented people than we are in the specifics of, oh, we want to get a such and such kind of person right now. Yeah, that um, makes sense. And, um, you know, it, it's sort of strange because we're a, we're a company where, you know, we actually need things like history PhDs because we actually do, you know, stuff with, uh, you know, curating, you know, all military conflicts and history type thing where it's useful to, um, uh, you know, we, we need um, uh, we need people. Actually, another thing interesting to mention in, in connection with Wolfram Language is if you look at the people who are, you know, we, we have a, a whole lot of people who have, I would say, subject area backgrounds. Um, and uh, many of whom were not, you know, quotes, computer people particularly before, but they're very smart people and they, you know, uh, and uh, it's turned out many of them have become really, really strong Wolfram language programmers, um, which is an interesting thing to watch. I mean, it's, it's interesting to see that uh, and we, we see, you know, in, in, in educational level, for example, um, you know, like in K through 12 education, it's like, well, okay, which teachers are really going to understand this stuff? Is it going to be the math teacher? Is it going to be the, the computer science teacher who knows Java, for example? Or is it going to be the, you know, the head of the English department who's just, um, you know, a smart person who decides that they're going to pick the stuff up? Turns out, you know, it's not, uh, it turns out it's a, it's a diverse background of people. And that's the same thing we see in, um, in people who end up being, you know, really strong Wolfram language programmers. So I think the, the I, I guess the, 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 the point there is, is that it's um, a whole world of kind of computational language and sort of computational thinking is the most important thing. It's, it's a bit of a disruption relative to the, uh, you know, um, you know, we're all going to learn to be the, the, you know, the best, you know, churn out the maximum number of lines of code and make sure that, you know, the type checking works correctly. Type -checking. Right. Yeah, that um, makes sense. And, uh, you know, I think in, um, uh, uh, anyway, that, that's some, but, yeah, that, uh, so that, that totally makes sense. I think, I think the, the camp sounds awesome, especially 
for um, you know if people are interested in, uh, as you said, maybe they have a great background in history or particle physics or something like that, and this is a great way to to um, you know jump into computation and and programming yeah, and things right. like that. Um, right. No, it's it's been. I mean, look, uh, the, the the one for grown ups, that's the case. The one for high school kids, uh, there, that's that's interesting because you know it turns out that even at the fancy high schools, and we've tried very hard to get kids also not from the fancy high schools, um, but turns out that many fewer people are learning any kind of real programming, any kind of anything computational in high school than you might think. I mean, I'd kind of assumed with all the noise that's made about, oh, everybody's, you know, doing... Everyone's STEM you know, crazy. Right. Uh, you know, but it turns out a lot of these kids, and, and actually it's often, it's often the worst cases, they did a C++ class and they found it boring and they learned a bunch of, you know, the most important thing to do is to... I don't even know. Put I don't a even semicolon know what, every of, time or something. Yes, 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 right. It's... um. Uh, anyway, well, listen, I should, I should be off, but yeah, totally. So, so yeah, just to recap real quick. So if, if you're a student, you have access to Mathematica already. You just, you might've not known it. So definitely check it out. I mean, it's totally free. Um, go through your university and start playing with it and see how many people there are in each country and do all these cool things. Um, if you aren't a student, uh, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, but you can, you can still use it for free. Yeah, in fact, the, the web version, you can just go to the front of our website and it says immediate access and start up Wolfram Programming Lab, which is Wolfram Programming Lab is the full Wolfram language, but it's kind of themed for kids. Okay. So if you don't mind that it's themed for kids, you get it for free. Cool. Good to know. And and uh, if you want to integrate it with some something you're you, you already have half written you can use the wolfram language which is also free right for for personal use uh yeah i mean the the the, the wolfram engine i mean this is where it's uh everything gets complicated at this point but but sure. basically it's been um uh uh it's it's you know the, go to our website and you should find a path for yeah so, getting so Getting, so you, can go, uh, you can find good documentation. There's, 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 there's definitely at least a web way to, to sort of like a sandbox where you could play around yes, and understand exactly. the language right. and, and everything. And, and, cool. Thank you yeah. so much for uh, coming on the show. It's been amazing. Um, you know, it has gone a little long, but I'm sure the people are going to be, uh, they're not going to be upset about that. This is an absolutely fantastic interview. And thanks, thanks. for staying yeah, up late uh, with us. Uh, yeah, sounds great. It was fun. The intro music is AXO by Binar Pilot. Programming Throwdown is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike 2.0 license. You're free to share, copy, distribute, transmit the work, to remix, adapt the work, but you must provide uh, attribution uh, to uh, Patrick and I and uh, share alike in kind.